this April 26, 2021 City Council meeting. Thank you for joining us in this remote meeting format we're using in response to Governor Brown's Stay Home, Save Lives order. This format enables the City Council to meet, hear from the community, and take care of business while keeping everyone safe. Anyone wishing to access the meeting can do so by watching the live stream available on our website, <clears throat> the broadcast on Comcast Channel 21, or by following the access instructions listed for this meeting on the public webcast and meeting materials web page. We have a very full agenda tonight, including a public forum and one public hearing. If you wish to participate during the public forum portion of the meeting and haven't already done so, please raise your hand now to join the speaker's queue in one of two ways. For those viewing the meeting on a computer, laptop, or other device, click once on the hand icon. For those listening to the meeting on a phone, press star nine. We will continue accepting raised hands until 7.35 p.m. The meeting moderator will unraise or disallow any requests to speak that are made after the deadline. You will have two and a half minutes to speak. For those wishing to testify at the public hearing, please wait to raise your virtual hand until I announce that it is time to do so in my introductory remarks for that hearing. Request to speak will be accepted until the first person begins testifying. Uh, and just as a reminder, we are now allowing you the option of turning on your video when you are called to provide testimony. As your turn is announced, the meeting moderator will temporarily promote you to panelist status. You can unmute and turn on your video if you wish. Uh, and this can take a minute, so just hang in there as the moderator makes that happen. And also uh, just a reminder to use this uh, new increased access in a responsible way. Our intent is simply to be able to see one another's faces as testimony is given, but we reserve the right to withhold your, your um, speaking privilege if you are uh, not respectful of the council's code of conduct. And thank you for spending an evening with us for your flexibility and your patience in this virtual format. We all look forward to meeting in person. And uh, in, the in, in the interim, please feel free to contact any one of us individually or together via email or voicemail if there are testimony, you is, if, there, if you had testimony that you were unable to provide or wish to get to us in a different manner. And with that, uh, we'll begin with our first um, agenda item, which is committee reports and items of interest. And I'm looking for, I know that Councillor Syrett, so I'm going to let Councillor Syrett and Councillor Yeh and Councillor Semple. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. So I'm uh, following up on an email I sent out uh, to councillors today, and I apologize. I caused some confusion by not being explicit in what I was asking. So this is around our um, City of Eugene state and federal legislative policy statements. And I'm bringing this forward as the chair of the Intergovernmental Relations Committee. So the IGR, which is comprised of Councillor Keating, Councillor Evans, and myself, um, asked staff to uh, add a section on equity and inclusion uh, and then they populated that uh, list. There's seven items from uh, council policy directions um, or, or adopted resolutions that we've passed in the past. Uh, so the question I have and bringing forward is uh, asking if uh, there's a majority of councilors that would like to have a work session on what we've added to this uh, policy agenda, or if you are satisfied with uh, what we have added in the draft that I sent you today. So I'm not sure, Mayor, what the protocol is for answering that question. <laughs> I suppose uh, if someone felt uh, it was uh, important to do a work session on, they could put a motion forward to that effect and see if it passes. And that's the, the only thing I had for items and committee reports. I, uh, okay. Am I unmuted now? Yes. 
Okay, so the floor is open now. Uh, I have a number of counselors queued up, so we'll see if someone puts a motion forward that, who wants to have a work session on that language. And um, I have next in the queue, I have Councilor Ye. So mine's not in relation to Claire's thing. So do you want me to wait or just go? I'm going to let people roll okay. forward and whenever it comes up, it comes up and we can, we can deal with it if it does. Okay. Sounds great. So, uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so I just wanted to do a preview next month is Asian and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And I wanted to make sure folks got it on their calendars because there is some very exciting stuff that is happening here in Eugene uh, to help celebrate. The Asian, Asian Celebration is doing a night market. It's going to be every Friday um, at the park blocks from 4 to 10 p.m. And I am personally really excited about this. It sounds amazing. There's going to be performances and demonstrations and activities for youth. There'll be a marketplace, obviously. Um, also, just amazing Asian food as well. So if you're downtown on a Friday night, now you know what you should be doing. Um, but that's not all. There's also going to be exhibitions downtown um, in storefront windows of uh, arts and crafts and um, photography, I understand, and, and history. And it's just going to sounds like amazing. I think there's going to be more stuff. And as I hear about it, I will share. But I wanted to make sure everyone got those Fridays on their calendars now. Hey, thank you, uh, Councillor Semple and then Councillor Keating. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ye. I now I have something to do on Fridays. And I'm glad always to hear of anything happening downtown. Um, Sustainability Commission met last week. Thank you for the $5,000 in funding for um, stimulation and incentive and encouragement of sustainability related activities. Um, Looking forward to figuring out how we're going to communicate with council more often. Um, and uh, I think that's it for them. Everybody, please get your vaccine. It's really important um, to help everybody. So if you're having any uh, wait a while, please don't. Having a, a blood emergency, I don't know if it's been alleviated, but last Friday got emails saying we had less than 24 hours supply, which uh, I found very disturbing. So I don't usually do this stuff, but I texted everybody. Um, so please do that too. Um, it does not matter whether you've had a vaccine or not, or how soon you may have had the vaccine to give blood. Uh, this weekend, Sunday morning, I went down to the mission to tour the pro bono uh, facilities and their clinic. It was just so uplifting. It's such a, a critical need. And it was nice to be somewhere where people were, were actively doing stuff. Pro bono is veterinary care for um, animals of homeless people. And they had a cat part and a dog part get the necessary supplies uh, so i was just so encouraged by it um and it, it was wonderful to be there it was very calm and it was very kind and that's what i'd really like us to see more of remember the mayor's campaign for kindness um let's try being nice and behaving ourselves that's it thank you Thank you, Councillor Councilor Keating and then Councillor Zelenka. Thank you, Mayor. In anticipation of our ad hoc uh, committee on police reform, uh, I'm pleased to uh, see that our lawmakers in Salem passed nine bills today in regards to police reform, including but not limited to uh, uh, keeping police from abusing uh, powers by providing more clarity and how to manage unlawful assemblies. Uh, supporting training to identify and report crimes motivated by prejudice uh, based on gender, uh, which disproportionately affect uh, BIPOC and gender non-conforming communities, uh, a law that looks to prevent unjustifiable arrest for all Oregonians, but especially BIPOC communities and people experiencing homelessness. So thank you to our lawmakers who worked in a bipartisan effort to advance nine, uh, nine various uh, uh, police accountability reforms. Um, 
I also want to uh, uh, echo Councillor Semple's sentiment about getting a vaccination. So if you're on this council and you recently bought a house and you want to have a house party and have us all there, um, <clears throat> uh, please make sure you're vaccinated. And uh, I'm thrilled that my two weeks uh, is, is up this week. And so, uh, Councillor Zelenka, I look forward to uh, celebrating a beer, a beer with you, and and uh, let's start filling up that that late late spring, early summer schedule while still respecting the fact that we are rapidly increasing uh, transmission. So we still need to strongly support social distancing, mask wearing, and. Uh, 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 remember the four social distancing mask wearing help me out mayor help me out oh washing hands thank you um small groups and small gatherings and small gatherings right uh so i'm still going to be in the uh gather outside category uh until we can reach herd immunity but please uh go to lane county's website or go to your local pharmacy's website there are vaccinations aplenty available and don't miss out on the opportunity to return to some semblance of, of normalcy if you're within earshot please make sure you get your shot thank you uh councillor zelenka and then looks like councillor simple has another round yeah i uh get my second shot week after weekend after next so uh encourage everybody to get so get them if you um if, if to sign up for it the wayne county site or go to some of the um, pharmacies 95 percent of doctors who have gotten shots so um they're the people in the know and i trust them uh i'm a yes to a work session on the igr um I also wanted to point out, I put out a work session poll, should be coming out formally on a 50-50 climate change homelessness services funding, uh, ongoing funding mechanism. Uh, there was an addendum to that, which uh, that we also share the previous work that the Council Committee on Revenue, I think it was called, did, where we looked at many of the things that the, count, that the Sustainability Commission and some of the same funding sources and came to some conclusions about that. Um, I'm wondering if on, uh, on Wednesday's meeting on the 1059 work session, um, that's a pretty big decision and we only have 45 minutes after the presentation, we're probably gonna be 30 minutes of council deliberation on it. I think that's a pretty big decision to be making with only that limited amount of conversation, but uh, I'm wondering if there's a deadline that we need to meet by, or can we have two sessions on that and maybe ask questions on Wednesday and have brought back. Um, third, um, I'm wondering if we could get uh, Chief to send us a memo or an email or talk to us about catalytic converters. <laughs> it's getting rampant. One Highway 99 business has, has, has a big banner that says we buy catalytic converters. Uh, hopefully the state uh, actually does what they did with wire and stop that practice. Um, uh, I'm also wondering if uh, of those 800 or so vehicles that we have that are car camping around the city, if we know what states those license plates are from. Um, my guess is they're a vast majority of them, are, if not, are from Oregon. And then um, Wednesday, we start the budget process, yay, uh, for the month of May. And so uh, um, I'll look forward to seeing all of you, plus the budget committee members, even more. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Sample, another comment? I just, I found what I was missing from the Sustainability Commission report. Um, they passed their energy and building and funding for sustainability efforts, so recommendations and sent us emails. So I encourage you to read that. Thank you. Thank you. And manager, did you have some things you wanted to bring up? Um, you know, I was going to, I'm, I'm looking at a note right here. Uh, I was just going to mention, I sent an email, but I'll just say again that I did sign the, the purchase and sale agreement for the MGP site at eWeb and Frank subsequently signed it after I, after I sent you that email. So we're, we're moving forward with that. I'm trying to, um, if you talk amongst yourselves, I think I'll have an answer on your timing about 1059 in just a second.
Okay. Um, so was there a motion? Do you want to put a motion on the table to have a work session regarding the IGR language? Was there um, an interest in doing that at this point? Or do you want to go through a work session poll? I need uh, someone to raise a hand. Can you just take, take a straw poll? I can take a straw poll. Do you want to have a work session on the... What, Oh, I can see Catherine poised to say something to me I, about I, that. I just wanted to make sure, it looks like Claire might be, or I'm sorry, Councillor Soret is gonna be making this uh, distinction, but without a work session, it would just go forward as the IGR recommendation. Right. And so the work session would be to bring it back. I just wanted to make sure the council understood. Right, right. Yes, so it's whether you feel you need to have a work session on this or comfortable with the IGR simply proceeding with that language. Councillor Zelenka. Well, um, since last not being on the IGR, I feel very disconnected from what the IGR does. I think most councillors are not on the IGR do as well. Very difficult to track and um, and things move fast. Um, so I feel strongly that we should talk about this. So I moved to hold a work session on Claire's uh, um, item for uh, from IGR. Is there a second? Councilor Second. Oh, okay. Okay, there's a second. Any oh, any just further discussion about that? All in favor, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, seven. All right, we're up there. Thank you. And all opposed? One. Okay, so passes seven to one. Thank you very much for just moving that along. And <laughs> Uh, well, you know, uh, if I could speak to it, Mayor, as to why, sure. uh, you know, the, the, C Councillor Syret and Councillor Evans and, and, and the mayor as an ex officio member and, 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 and staff, and Ethan's been great to work with, have been very intentional about uh, the language and the work. And um, I would just ask if, if maybe there's, uh, if, you know, if, if Councillor Zelenka, if, if the work session is the, the model by which you would like to get those checkups or check-ins, or if this vehicle is the, the venue, or if you want more regular e-communication, because um, I'm rather pleased with the intentionality, especially in the, in the equity bucket uh, that, that we have with the language. And so I, I, I don't know if there's a real need for mm -hmm. it to go to the larger council to be changed up so much because of so much work that already went into it. So that's that's the reason why I, I I voted the way the way I did. But if it's appropriate, if, if you you don't have to answer now, of course, Councillor. But if the, if there are suggestions you have, I would love to hear them about how how I or how our committee members may may communicate uh, to a way that you find satisfactory. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, well, we used to have a lot of IGR issues come before council. And we used to spend quite a bit of time being involved in that process and and matriculating through all of the different bills that were of controversy. And uh, and at that when I was not on the IGR, I felt like that's how I kept track of what was going on and what was happening. And um, I, when I was on the IGR, that made a little difference. You're on the IGR, so you you're immersed in this. When you're not on the IGR, it's difficult to track, and it's and it, and you don't get to have be in on the conversation about the nuances. So, um, it's not necessarily about the specific language or changes to the specific language. It's about the information, having the discussion at council, and informing count the whole council plus the public that wants to watch it. So that's why I prefer work sessions on this. And I, I miss not having work sessions on, a, on, on the, what's happening at the session uh, on a more regular basis. It all just gets handled through the IGR and we get memos every once in a while. And that doesn't work for me. And I've expressed that opinion several times. Thanks. Okay, Councillor Syrett. <clears throat> yeah, so my understanding is that things only come to council if the IGR does not have a 3-0 vote on an item. So in years past, apparently, there were a lot of two-to-ones on the IGR, and that's not the case right now. So uh, that's the, you know, the mechanism by which a specific issue is brought towards the council. I will say a little tongue-in-cheek, Councilor Zanka, maybe you need to lobby the mayor to put you on the IGR. Um, that would be one solution. 
<laughs> I was on the IGR. Oh, okay. Um, I think you replaced me. <laughs> oh, sorry. Ha happy to do it, though. Um, so I guess maybe that's a broader discussion and it could be brought up at the work session about what, you know, because we've talked about that at the IGR, like what is the way to keep the council more um, up to date and maybe it is having a couple of work sessions during the legislative session. Um, so, you know, I don't have any heartburn about discussing that. I think that's a totally legitimate discussion for us to all have. Yeah, well, I think we can follow up. We can follow up with that. And um, uh, okay, Councilor Clark, and then I'm going to go back to the manager. Thank you, Mayor. I, I suspect that my time on the IGR produced a great deal more opportunity for discussion, Councilors, like at the at the council table. I uh, <clears throat> well, actually, when George Poling and I uh, were sure together. There were an awful lot of two one votes that uh, where, where George and I were in agreement that brought it back. And, George or Betty. <laughs> and, and, and Betty was in disagreement, and so those came to the table. Um, I actually have a, a larger concern than our ability to stay in contact and informed about what's going on every day. I, I would support a work session now that I think about it, because what was true then is, is especially and doubly true now, which is that it's most often the case that our IGR committee represents a point of view that is legitimate and, and represents a majority of the council and probably represents a majority of the voters in our community and, and kind of walks in lockstep in the, on the same issues that come before the legislature. But there's a significant portion of our community, a minority of our community that disagrees on many of those policies and never gets input at the legislature through their representatives at the city because of the way that works. And so if we're going to have a conversation about city policies, it depends to how we lobby the legislature. I would hope it's a substantial one where we're willing to take into account um, minority opinion in our community and how to effectively represent that at the legislative level. So one second. Okay. Thank you. Um, manager, did you have more information to share? Yeah, I don't, we don't have a, a close timeline driving that decision on Wednesday. So I think let's have the conversation and see what other information you have. The direction in the packet was, was to have a start negotiating. It wasn't a final decision anyway. So I think it'll be, we've got time. Okay, with that, um, before we go to the consent calendar too, I got things a little bit out of order and had started in our last um, public forum night with a land acknowledgement and I s made the mistake of diving into items before doing that. So I will go back and um, speak to this, this important recognition. Since time immemorial, the Calipers- Mary, stop the consent. I'm going to get there. I just said I got it out of order before I get there. Since time immemorial, the Kalapuya people have been the indigenous stewards to our region, building dynamic communities, maintaining balance with wildlife, and enacting sustainable land practices. Following treatise, treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homeland by the United States government and forcibly removed to the coast reservation in Western Oregon. The city of Eugene is built within the traditional homelands known as Kalapuya Ilihi. Kalapuya descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians of Oregon. They continue to make contributions in our communities here and across the lands. We acknowledge the inherent political sovereignty of the nine federally recognized tribal nations in the state of Oregon and all American Indian Alaska Native people who live here. And with that, we are ready to now more properly enter this meeting. And so we'll move to the consent calendar. Thanks, Mayor. I move to approve the items on consent calendar one. Second. All right, I thank you. I know I have two people with comments. So uh, uh, Councilor Groves and then Councilor Zelenka. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a 
two corrections on the meeting minutes from February 22nd. Um, first page, item two, committee reports and items of interest. First bullet, Councillor Groves. It says Mike McFarland. His name is McFarlane, A-N-E, if we could correct that. And second, he was appointed to the Sustainability Commission uh, rather than the Environmental Board. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, and Councillor Zalenka. Yeah, I'd like to pull items C and D, and I sent some questions for staff to respond to if they could. Okay. So we will vote on the consent calendar with the amended minutes and the tentative agenda. Uh, all in favor? Please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six. People moved around. I think I've got, have I got all eight of you? It looks like it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And now, uh, uh, Councilor Zelenka. Oh, I just wanted to pull item C and D. They're both about housing, and I, that's one of our biggest crises, affordable housing that we have um, in part. One's about housing, one's about COVID, but uh, they're related. So I just wanted staff to address both of those things, um, in particular on the one-year action plan. How does that fit within the consolidated plan, and what is this action plan actually doing and allocating money towards? And then for, for D, you can go to that one, too. Um, uh, what are we allocating CV3, CDBC, CV3 for, and what is it going to accomplish? And what did we got one before, and we don't really, I don't think we discussed that very much either. So if that one can be touched on as well. Thank you. Sure. Good evening. Happy to do that. Uh, my name is Amanda Noble Flannery, and I'm the Acting Community Development Co Director. The consolidated plan was approved by council a year ago and it covers a five year period for Eugene and Springfield. It presents an assessment of local housing, homelessness and community development needs, identifies priority needs and presents strategies to address those needs. The affordable housing strategies are to increase the supply of affordable housing, rehabilitate existing housing affordable to low income people, provide down payment assistance for home ownership, provide rental assistance for housing stability and homelessness prevention, remove barriers to affordable and supportive housing. The community development strategies are to support human service delivery system to address the needs of homeless people, special needs populations, and other low income populations, to promote economic development and employment opportunities through the creation of jobs and business development, and to make strategic investments to improve low-income neighborhoods and other areas of slums and blight. Tonight's requested action is for council to approve the Eugene Springfield Action Plan Summary for the coming fiscal year. Council takes this action annually, allocating federal funds for affordable housing, human services, and job creation investments. The action plan covers two sources of federal funding that the city receives each year. The first is the Community Development Block Grant, and the second is the Home Investment Partnerships Program, and those funds we share with Springfield. The proposed allocation of $3.7 million is aligned with the community needs and strategies outlined in the five-year consolidated plan and includes funding for the purchase of a land bank site for future affordable housing development, rehabilitating existing affordable housing, human services in both operations via Lane Community, uh, Lane, excuse me, Lane County Human Services Commission up to the regulatory capped amount and service provider facility improvements. Economic development through the city's business growth loan program, fair housing training and education, affordable housing development, a quarter of which is for projects in Springfield and operating support for affordable housing providers. The proposed allocation was reviewed by the Block Grant Advisory Committee, who held a public hearing. It was also posted for a 30-day written comment period. Thank you for your consideration of these important community programs. Okay, Did, uh, do we need to vote on these separately, or can we do both of these items in the vote on to them together? So do you want to hear a 
uh, Councilor Zelenka, it's your request. Do you want to hear an explanation of item D as well? Sure, that'd be good. Then we can combine them. Yep. All right. So uh, requested action is for council to approve a substantial amendment to the action plan that's in place for this current year. This action would allocate an additional round of special COVID related community development block grant funding. These are funds from the Federal CARES Act, Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act with the abbreviation CV that have come through in separate rounds. Last summer, council approved the use of CV1 funds. It was just over $800,000 for human service operations with access as to rent and legal assistance and expanded homeless services, microenterprise training and fair housing. Oregon entitlement cities like Eugene did not receive CV2 funds. And this tonight's allocation is for CV3. The proposed CV3 allocation of $1 million is aligned with the five-year consolidated plan community needs and strategies. And it complies with regular block grant requirements. The funds will be used to prevent, prepare for, or respond to COVID-19 impacts and includes investments in human services, business lending to support employment, and fair housing. Unlike regular block grant funds, CV3 has no limit on human services funding. As a result, the proposed allocation has 70% of the funds focused on this area. The pandemic has had a significant impact on people experiencing homelessness as well as the congregate shelter system. Reduced shelter capacity and decreased access to basic needs, resources, and service locations has further destabilized vulnerable community members. The 700,000 would be used to expand homeless services, including support for emergency shelter and day access center, outreach services and navigation over a two year period, and housing navigation services. The proposed allocation is a result of reviewing and matching COVID-related community needs, potential uses, and grant regulations. Through internal meetings, consultations with Lane County, and conversations with service providers and community members, it was reviewed by the Block Grant Advisory Committee who held a public hearing, and it was posted for a 25-day written comment period. Again, thank you for your consideration of this important community funding. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Zelenka, did you want to speak to it? Yeah, just um, $700,000 for expanded homeless services, um, $72,000 for access to food and business lending, $50,000. And also the uh, uh, Eugene Springfield Tenants Association uh, um, commented that we really need to support a tenant hotline, which I see is funded here for part of the $15,000, which I think is an important part of this package as well, all of which are related to housing. So. Um, Thank you for all of that. And I, I'll let the council president make a motion. Thank you, Councilor Zelenka. So I move to approve item C and D from the consent, consent calendar. Second. All in favor, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Thank you very much. And now, and thank you for pulling those items out. It was good to, and thank you, Amanda, for explaining those more fully. Uh, and now we are ready to move into the public forum. The public forum is an opportunity for individuals to speak to city council on any city related issues, except for those items which have already been heard by a hearings official or are on tonight's agenda as a public hearing. When it is your turn, the moderator will announce your name and promote you to panelist status. Please state your name clearly and for Eugene residents, your ward if known before beginning your comments. Again, each person will have two and a half minutes to speak. If you are watching the meeting, the timer should be visible. A yellow light will come on when you have 15 seconds to complete your comments. The red light and beep indicate the end of the two and a half minutes. When your time has concluded, the moderator will demote you back to attendee status and move on to the next speaker. For those who have connected to the meeting via phone, and don't have the benefit of seeing the timer, please be aware that your microphone will be muted at the two and a half minute mark. Uh, also, I'm gonna remind a couple of reminders that public forum is limited to 90 minutes total. It looks like we have 33 people who have raised their hands. So um, 
being as succinct as possible enables the largest number of people to testify as possible. That is my first comment. And uh, the second thing I want to remind you that we also do have a public hearing tonight, specifically on the on the uh, proposal to create safe uh, parking and tent sites. And so if you're here to speak to that, I'm hoping that you will wait for the public hearing and allow people who wish to speak to other issues have the time to speak during the public forum. So just a reminder that if that's the topic, wait, please wait until the public hearing begins. And with that, um, Naya, I think we're ready to start. Thank you, Mayor. First, we have Zach Mulholland, who will be testifying on behalf of the Sustainability Commission, followed by Cascadia Wildlands. Hello, Mayor and Council. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Zach Mulholland, and I'm the chair of the Eugene Sustainability Commission. I wanted to thank you for your discussion last week of how to work with boards and commissions better. Uh, during that conversation, you started to hone in on the idea of a mid-year and end-of-year check-in with commissions. And I wanted to say that you are right on track. That is exactly what the Sustainability Commission has been asking for, is a mid-year and an end-of-year chance to present the recommendations that we have drafted up until that point. And then at the end of the year, we would also present our end-of-year annual report. Um, <clears throat> we discussed this idea last month and I sent you a letter uh, about two weeks ago and I, I resent it tonight with the, the language from the commission with our request. Uh, and so uh, I just look forward to the opportunity to uh, present our recommendations and our end of year annual report. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work this year and have made a lot of progress on our annual uh, uh, our work plan. And so uh, I look forward to getting the chance for you to uh, receive those recommendations, uh, ask any questions that you may have, and uh, hopefully take some type of action uh, based upon those ideas. Uh, and then on, on a side note, I did just want to thank you, Councillor Zelenka, for the work session poll that you put out on homelessness services and climate action. It's exactly what we need. And uh, I look forward to hopefully helping make that as successful as possible. So again, thanks so much for your time and uh, have a great evening. Thanks, bye. Thank you, Zach. Next is Cascadia Wildlands, followed by Jackson. Um, hello, Mayor Venice and City Councilors. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify tonight. Uh, my name is Dylan Plummer, and I'm the grassroots organizer with Cascadia Wildlands, a local 501c3 nonprofit working to protect public lands and imperiled species and fight for climate justice. Live in World War II. I want to start by just uh, echoing the remarks of the sustainability chair in support of the work session poll from Councillor Zelenka. Uh, we wholeheartedly support raising revenues to go towards um, to go towards climate justice and to addressing the houseless crisis that our city is facing. And um, additionally, we believe that the polluters must be the ones held responsible for paying for solutions. Um, I'm here today specifically to highlight the falsehoods that Northwest Natural and its allies have told this body, specifically regarding the potential of renewable natural gas and green hydrogen as viable alternatives to the current quote unquote natural fracked gas used in homes and commercial buildings. Time and time again, we have heard the talking point repeated that if allowed to continue to expand its infrastructure, Northwest Natural and other fossil fuel corporations will replace the dirty fracked gas in their pipes with clean and renewable alternatives, primarily green hydrogen, renewable natural gas. This is an explicit lie and a tactic to delay regulation and further entrench our city, our state, and our country in a fossil fuel system that is incompatible with continued human habitation on this planet. A 2018 Oregon Department of Energy report demonstrated that renewable natural gas could only meet up to one fifth of our state's current gas demands. Renewable natural gas is primarily generated through industrial animal agriculture and landfills, both of which have outsized impacts on the environment and the disproportionately BIPOC and low income communities that they are sited near. Green hydrogen, while promising as a mechanism for renewable energy storage, is not a viable alternative to the fracked gas we currently use in buildings. According to the Natural Renewable Energy Laboratory, green hydrogen can only be mixed with natural gas at levels between 5 and 15% before it becomes unusable in existing gas pipes and infrastructure. This is not to mention that the health impacts of combusting hydrogen in homes is similar to, if not worse than, those of fracked gas, which we know is extremely dangerous. Uh, these are not easy solutions that the industry would have us believe, and we must not allow them to continue to delay action to regulate gas infrastructure with their misinformation campaigns. 
Gas in buildings is the fastest growing source of greenhouse gas emissions in the region. And as a forthcoming UN report lays out, expanding the, quote, expanding the use of natural gas is incompatible with keeping global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Thank you, Dylan. Your time has expired. Next is Jackson, followed by Ben Christian. It looks like Jackson um, may have been disconnected. So next will be Ben Christensen, followed by Nancy A. All right, can you hear me? Yes. All right, I'm gonna start things off tonight. The City Council and the media will receive a full statement with a clear set of demands later tonight, laying out a clear pattern of corruption, conflicts of interest, and blatant disregard for both ethics, morals, and morals up to and including potential nepotism. It shows that the City Council and the City gives the police and their allies and the City Manager's office and the private sector undue influence over the funding that the police receive. It is physically impossible that all the conflicts of interest that are brought up in the document were missed by the City Council and the City Manager's office. There also is no way that the power, the people in power that are appointing people's spouses into positions where they have undue influence over police policy and funding did not go or do not understand what the term nepotism is. The city council levied a tax, a very unpopular tax taken directly out of the people's paychecks under the guise that it was going to go to public services to deal with a combination of issues, including homelessness, affordable housing, infrastructure and emergency services that are alternatives to policing. Instead, the city appoints people who have clear conflicts of interest that are pro-police to oversee the entire process to ensure that the lion's share of the money goes of this new tax goes directly into the police's budget. In the year when we saw a record number of protests calling for the defunding of the police and to have money divested into other services, the city council and the city officials decided that the only way that they could ensure the majority of the money would go to the police was to ensure that this process was rigged from the start. As it currently stands, the City Council has created a document called the CSI. It is so full of corruption, it could not possibly be used to justify a record increase in the police budget. Despite that, that is exactly what the City Council is planning to try to do in the next two weeks when they start their work session. Last time I spoke, I brought up concerns that I, as a person with a disability, had with regards to increasing the police budget and what it meant for me. And what I was met with was contempt and dismissal. This was not acceptable of a city official. So I'm going to again ask the exact same question. How does increasing the police budget budget benefit me? I'm also I'm calling for all the demands of the document to be met, and I'm also calling for a detailed investigation from an independent third party into the people involved. I'm also calling for all those findings to be made available to the public. This is called true transparency. Thank you. I yield back the rest of my time. Thank you, Ben. Next is Nancy A, followed by Jackson. What about the final? Nancy, please unmute. Okay, so I'm going to move on to Jackson. Nancy, I will come back to you. Hi, how are you? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes, okay. My name is Eric Jackson. Uh, I am a homeless advocate in Eugene for three years now. Since the Martin Boise case, uh, the city has continued with the planter strip ordinance, the attempt at the panhandling ordinance, um, the now attempting to pass ordinances that are just going to not, as Mike so explicitly said, play Mac whack-a-mole, but it will just play musical chairs. Just musical chairs. 
That's all that will happen. So everybody that's in one spot will move to the other spot. And everybody that's in one spot will move to the other spot. It is not providing a legal place. And Matt, thank you so much for voting against it. Just in its essence, uh, I know there's still going to be public hearings on it, but if you're creating a camping in cars ordinance, no, you're not doing that. It seemed that that's what it said across the bottom of the screen. It seemed that that's what I'm going to be bringing in the federal case if it goes forward. It seemed that that's all you were talking about was how to move the homeless out of the areas that they're in. Now, you, for making 90 degree turns, Council Groves, they can just paint yellow lines so that it's clear. Uh, I've, I've seen it done in New York. If it's done by the place that owns it and they do it, nobody's going to be complaining that there's not cars parked there preventing a 90 degree turn. Nobody's going to complain that the lines on the road are not legally applied. They're just going to avoid them. There's ways to secure things that are curative. And you guys are never going to be able to fix this ever because you're never going to have a grip on what goes on in the streets unless you come out and stay there or you start hiring the intelligent homeless people that are already running the camps to run the camps and get these people services because those people know where the services are because I know I do and I know that there's a dozen of me out here at least. So you guys got to think about this because it's long term. The only way this is going to get affected is if you stop making a master's degree, the basic requirements for helping the homeless. It's absurd. It's ill-conceived thought of where the basics of survival should come from and where the basics of planting people back into housing successfully come from. So you guys got to think about these things. You should include homeless in your meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Jackson. Next is Nancy A, followed by Jacob Drouet. Thank you. Um, I'm Nancy Honert from Ward 2, and I want to thank the city councilors for the time that you've spent on city business and for listening to us. I'm here in support of a moratorium on new natural gas infrastructure. A new gas furnace installed now will likely last more than 10 years. In 10 years, we need to have reduced our fossil fuel use, including natural gas, by 50% to avoid the worst, most catastrophic climate change. How can we do that if we go on increasing our natural gas installation and infrastructure? Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Next is Jacob, followed by 350 Eugene. Hi, Jacob, please unmute. Here we go. Thank you. Uh, I'm a constituent in Ward 1. Um, the, the City Council has an opportunity to move responsibly to allocate funds from the Community Safety Initiative away from wasteful spending on uh, policing and jailing and instead on housing and sheltering the unhoused community members uh, in our community. Uh, I urge you to take this opportunity. Um, the CAHOOTS model is already nationally recognized as a viable alternative to the majority of police functions and doesn't engender, engender trauma in many community members. Uh, national events have clearly shown that policing as it stands now is unable to efficiently, effectively, and humanely address people who are in mental health crisis. Um, spending our tax dollars on sweeps is not only cruel, but inefficient and ineffective. Uh, relatedly, I do urge you to reject the development proposal for the publicly owned 1059 Willamette property. The development proposal from DeChase Mikis Eldon, I don't know exactly how to pronounce the name, I apologize, includes $10 million in public assistance, but will not provide truly affordable housing. Um, under, under the proposal, they do have $1,000 studio apartments listed as what they'll provide for affordable housing, but you can't have a family in uh, a studio apartment effectively. And where the Eugene area already has a surplus of studio apartments at the $1,000 mark. Um, I propose that the 1059 Willamette property be used for the public good by supporting the development of community land trust, uh, by you know, supporting the development of community land trust or community owned housing for marginalized residents. Uh, thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. 
Thank you, Jacob. Next is 350 Eugene, followed by Carolyn Partridge. Good, good evening. My name is Deborah McGee, and I've lived in Lane County for 40 years. Happy belated Earth Day. I share a line from a song. I've been lying awake and wondering at night where it all went wrong. We're running in this human race and the odds are looking long. 417 parts per million of CO2 in our atmosphere, overarching our issues and heating up our tissues. Recently, I heard that most folks think climate change means more sunshine and heat, good for many things, but it's not the temperature increase, it's the cascade chorus of the 50 feedback loops of the biological systems of Earth collapsing that will cause all the issues, issues we are leaving to our children and our unborn grandchildren. I know between what for some of you are full-time jobs and the part-time council gig, you probably can't follow what the county is doing too closely, but I follow the climate issues and I attend each of the Zoom community citizen action meetings on the climate plan. And since you all live in Lane County, I'd like to give you a quick update, at least from my perspective, of course. It's great that the city is chaired by a young indigenous woman, which brings a lot of new perspectives. It's great the committee has scientists and folks who are working in public agencies and environmentalism. So science and truth are ruling. While it does have a timber lobbyist, there's no one from the gas industry on the committee. The county seems to be moving much more quickly than the city of Eugene, whose plan was to engage the large liver shareholders to voluntarily take responsibility for their pollution, which has resulted in the 40% gap and Eugene's plan to fail. I knew at one time there was talk of a dashboard on the city's site charting our climate progress. Where is that dashboard? Did it just never get prioritized? We need every city, every county, and every person on board. Cities in Lane County are looking at Eugene to see how we are confronting this crisis. So what Eugene matters does matters very much. And that's why we need to stop the expansion of fossil gas in our community. Solving this crisis is not a knowledge or technological issue. We have the solutions. The problem is political will and political leadership. We will have to change how we live. It won't be easy. Good leadership will help. We have to feel the first fierce urgency of now. The life support system of the earth is dying. We need action, my friends, action. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Next is Carolyn, followed by Busey. Can you hear me? Wow, good job, Debbie. Okay. Yeah. Good evening, Mayor and City Councilors. My name is Carolyn Partridge and I live in Ward 2. Issues tend to resurface until they are dealt with, and that's why the public forum often seems repetitive. That being said, I'm concerned that Eugene is not going to meet its carbon reduction goals by 2030. The large lever shareholders have already weighed in with the reductions that they will voluntarily make, and there is still nearly a 40% gap. We will not close this gap, even if a few more people decide to ride the bus or their bikes or weatherize their home or cut down on hamburgers. These actions are helpful and need to be encouraged, but we will only meet the goal if we start making some hard systemic decisions in 2021. We can't stop the city from growing, even though a growing population will bring additional emissions. However, we can mitigate the amount of additional emissions, which raises the topic of the Northwest Natural Franchise Agreement. When gas is used in any building, it generates more emissions than if the building ran on electricity alone. So to continue installing more gas is to sabotage our goal. That is why a moratorium on gas expansion makes so much sense. It is a way to phase out a higher emission fuel in a way that does not require people to replace existing infrastructure. It is a perfect shot on goal and we shouldn't pass it up. There may not be another comparable opportunity between now and 2030. If you aren't willing to do this, I hope you will ask yourselves just what you are willing to do. We don't want to get to 2029 and realize that we are going to miss our goal 
or that very draconian measures will have to be employed in order to meet the goal. Some of you have implied that Eugene's emissions are just a drop in the bucket, and this is true, but buckets are filled one drop at a time. It would be immoral to shirk our responsibility for the emissions we are causing. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Carolyn. Next is QC, followed by phone ending in 834. Hello, Mayor Venice, city councilors and city managers. Um, thank you so much for providing the opportunity to provide public testimony. My name is Madeline Cowan, um, and I work with a group called Firefighters United for Safety, Ethics, and Ecology. I'm also a member of Ward 2, and I've uh, lived on Eugene for about six years on occupied and stolen Kalakuya Ilihi land. I wanted to thank you for your decision to walk away from the negotiations with Northwest Natural over the franchise agreement that, as they currently stand and for holding the corporate account accountable to the desires of your constituency, the people of Eugene, in regards to greenhouse gas reductions by allowing the current agreement to lapse. For my job, I work a lot with and directly with uh, wildland firefighters who tell me day in and day out the struggles that they, they experience during every single wildfire season. This year, the wildfire season is expected to start as soon as mid-June or early July for Eugene and surrounding areas. In Southern Oregon, the wildfire season is expected to start the first week in June. And the and I'm so I'm here today to to bring a sense of urgency that I'm hearing from these communities about the climate crisis that we are facing. So I'm also um, here to testify on behalf of the Fossil, Fossil Free Eugene Coalition in which my organization, FUSI, is a part of. We are part of a growing movement in Eugene and across the, the region advocating for a just transition to renewable energy. And we are specifically focused on working towards the electrification of buildings as they provide a clear mechanism for dramatically re reducing the greenhouse gas emissions of our city, our state, and our region. I have 30 seconds left, so I'll just leave you with um, one, uh, one fact, um, and that is around the repowering of our buildings. So repowering our buildings um, in Eugene to run on clean, high-efficiency electric um, appliances instead of um, instead of uh, natural gas, um, we can actually um, reduce the amount of pollution that is in those homes by 43%. So uh, I urge you to continue your great work and goodbye. <laughs> Thank you, Mad Madeline. Next is phone ending in 834, followed by Amanda. Good evening, Mayor Venice, City Councilors, and City Manager Maderi. My name is Maria, and I live and work in Ward 4. For too long, police departments across the country have avoided accountability for the harms they have caused. Last week, Minneapolis police were held criminally accountable when Derek Chauvin was convicted on all three counts of the murder of George Floyd. But at a time when the eyes of the world are scrutinizing U.S. policing, police officers continue to brutalize and kill people. Since the end of March, law enforcement officers have killed over 60 people, including a person with mental illness to our north in Portland, and two children, 16-year-old Micaiah Bryant in Ohio, and 13-year-old Adam Toledo in Illinois. This cannot continue. Here in Eugene, we've had our own tragedies, and now you have the opportunity to help make real changes in our community and hold the police accountable. The Ad Hoc Committee on Police Policy has been working for months to create uh, to create recommendations for the Eugene Police Department. The committee is made up of members representing communities of color and other marginalized populations who are most harmed by police brutality. I urge you to take seriously their recommendations and pressure the Eugene Police Department to adopt them. Words are not enough. Take action to show the marginalized and vulnerable members of our community that you actually care about keeping them safe. Thank you, and I yield my remaining time.
Thank you. Next is Amanda, followed by Wiley Nelson. Hi, my name's Amanda. I'm a business owner, a small business owner in Eugene. Um, I'd like to talk today again about the uh, crisis of the unhoused, um, what they're having on, uh, the impact that that is having on our business. Uh, we are located in right downtown across from Washington Jefferson Park. Um, I want to start by saying I understand that not all unhoused individuals are um, disobeying or violating criteria or laws, um, that there is only a select few that are doing that, but that's what I want to speak to tonight. Those individuals that choose to not follow the, the rules and laws um, that are set out there, um, but are impacting our business, are impacting the businesses inside of our business. Um, our clients are losing customers, which impacts our business as well. It's very, it, I, I don't want to minimize the impact that the homeless is having, but I, I understand this is a very complex issue to, and there's lots of strong opinions on each side of this issue, so I don't want to minimize that. Um, and I want to make sure that we show compassion to those that find themselves in an unhoused situation. However, those that choose to disobey laws and rules need to be held accountable, whether they are housed or unhoused. And we are simply calling right now as business owners that the city officials and that our authorities are able to keep those accountable uh, for their choices when they disobey or break laws. I implore you as the mayor and council to empower our police to uh, keep people accountable, empower our city officials to keep people accountable when they choose to break laws, whether they are housed or unhoused. I also want to speak to the Washington Jefferson Park area. Um, we have been fighting um, the battle of unsanitary conditions impacting our business. And um, if we're in a pandemic right now, it seems to me that this would be a priority um, to keep that park sanitary and clean. And I understand that there's officials there trying to do that but it is not enough. We cannot waste any more time. Um, there is an urgency to this because businesses are being affected. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Next is Wiley, followed by Eli. Followed by me. Wiley, you're yep. up. My name is Wiley Nelson. I'm a business owner and electrician. My company recently purchased a commercial building on Cap Court in West Eugene. And I've been working there since February, preparing the building for our business to move into. Our block on Cap Court has about seven recreational vehicles parked permanently on one side of the street with a variety of other vehicles belonging to the same people parked on the other side. Some of the RVs have bump out extensions deployed that extend another two to three feet into the travel lane greatly exacerbating the problem. The end result is that there's barely enough room for one semi truck to pass down our street and never enough for another vehicle to pass a semi truck safely. This situation would be bad enough without any other contributing factors. That is generally not the case. In the approximately two months I've been working on this project, I've seen loose animals, unattended children, and dozens of vehicles and pedestrians impeding the flow of traffic. I've also had some very serious problems with crime and bad behavior, including littering, vandalism, and threats. I'm overlooking as much of it as I can, but feel that the situation is no longer tolerable. When we first took possession of this building, I hauled about a thousand pounds of trash away from the street and disposed of it. But within less than one week, there was a new motorhome occupying the section of the street I had cleaned up and a rapidly expanding pile of new trash to go along with it. The three large forklift loads of trash I removed only cleared a fraction of our building frontage, and since then, more than that has appeared. The issues with traffic and littering are the most consistent problems that we have noticed, but I've also had some serious concerns about other crimes and a pervasive atmosphere of lawlessness that has started to exist in the absence of enforcement of parking and camping violations. One of the campers on my street commonly has 10 or more different visitors during a workday, including some that are actually so unconcerned with concealing their purpose that they count their money outside in the street before going inside to engage in whatever commerce they are here to accomplish. I was concerned enough about this behavior, I videotaped some of them, and as a result, I was threatened with violence by several people, including one 
got out of his car carrying a wrench in response to my camera and approached the front of my business before thinking better of it. I have contacted parking enforcement dozens of times about this issue, and so far the only vehicle that was removed was a pickup truck that was on cinder blocks with no tires installed. But none of the RVs have been removed or have moved noticeably on their own. I have contacted the police and DHS with some of my concerns was told they can't do anything about it unless something worse happens that's directly enforceable. I would prefer not to wait for that to occur. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Next is Eli, followed by Zombie. Good evening. I live in Ward 1. And in February 2020, Eugene's Human Rights Commission sent a detailed report to council detailing the city's pervasive criminalization of homelessness and making recommendations for ordinance and policy changes. The report found that because of the laws and rules in Eugene that make life-sustaining activities for the unhoused population illegal, there is, quote, literally no square inch in Eugene where our houseless neighbors are, quote, legally allowed to exist. As far as I know, none of the recommendations in the report have been acted upon. In fact, the city is going in the opposite direction. I realize there has been a decreased level of enforcement of the rules and laws prohibiting camping for folks in particular locations, but the sweeps are continuing throughout the pandemic, forcing people to move with no place to go for no other reason than the fact that they are houseless. During the April 12th house homelessness update work session, Chief Skinner recognized the very real difference between a sense of safety versus actual safety. Yet the council is currently discussing further punitive measures against people who are unhoused to protect housed people's quote, sense of safety, potentially forcing them to move without giving them a place to go yet again. Chief Skinner also recognized the importance of getting people stabilized and getting people off the street and considering the reallocation of community safety initiative funds. And I would like to ask the city to reallocate 80% of the community safety initiative funds, all of the parts that are currently designated for the police courts and enforcement to housing for people who need it, for low income people, people on the streets not people who make $36,000 a year, which is the income level needed to live at 1059 Willamette, um, which is straight up corporate welfare. Um, I asked the city to reject um, the 1059 Willamette project as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Zondi, followed by Mia Nelson. Can you hear me? Hi, it's an honor to be here tonight to represent over 12 community organizations, all of whom want you to reject the proposal at 1059 Willamette. These organizations include the NAACP, the Lane East Asian Network, Community Alliance of Lane County, known as Cal, Black Indigenous and Women of Color Rising, Black Sex Workers Collective, Cooperation Eugene, 350 Eugene, Eugene DSA, Lane County Surge or Standing Up for Racial Justice, Solidarity Not Cops, Transponder, the Stop the Sweets Network, also prominent members of the League of United Latin American Citizens. They were unable to procedurally um, rep be represented, um, be representing LULAC, um, but are representing themselves. That includes the president, Juan Carlos Delval, Patricia Toledo Robbins, Silverio Mogart, also prominent indigenous community members, Erica Lincongo and Sandra Shotridge, Shotridge, whose names you might recognize from their recent service for the city. All of these people and organizations and others want you to reject the current proposal at 1059 Willamette. I want to offer myself as a resource to you. There is a eight page document which does a financial analysis of the terms of this deal, even if we ex ex um, even if we accept the rent suppression value to one thousand dollars a month, and over the thirty five years that that would play out, the ten million dollars worth of a transfer ends up with a thirty percent loss, three million dollars 
just just disappears. And that is, I have a, had a lawyer tell me that this, that is actionable, that that disregard um, or in poor management of public resources. So Lane County assesses the market value of that property. Lane County records assess it at 6.8 million. You're planning to give another 1.1 million and then a 10 year tax break worth 2 million. That's a $10 million public subsidy for so-called affordable housing that at $1,000 a month isn't even affordable. And the city itself acknowledges a $4,800 800 unit surplus at that $1,000 studio mark. He absolutely needs to be rejected. Also, I'm dismayed to learn that the key staff person of the CSI review is married to the director of the Eugene Police Foundation. Thank you, Zamdi. Your time has concluded. Next is Mia, followed by Otis Pashmeyer. Good evening. My name is Mia Nelson. Uh, it's been many years since I've spoken here. It's nice to see all of you again. Um, I am here because my business recently purchased an industrial building at 3490 West First Avenue in Ward 8. Uh, we purchased this build building to expand our existing business, which currently has 35 full-time employees, and we plan to have over 100 by the end of next year. However, the current situation with Ill illegal camping is creating some real challenges for us. Our three-acre site fronts West First Avenue and the entire 900-foot length of Cap Court which is recently, or this is currently the location of a large and lawless RV encampment. Over the course of just a few short months, we have dealt with a fire, rampant drug dealing, pit bulls on our parking lot, theft, uh, human waste, garbage dumping, even threats of violence. Cap Court is one of the areas that your staff recommended um, for immediate changes to the no parking zones. And I agree this location must be a priority. We need help right now. The situation is out of control. I also agree with staff's recommended changes to your parking regulations, but with one exception, there absolutely must be an exception to the 72 hour parking rules for vehicles owned by adjacent businesses. We should not be required to move our own vehicles two blocks away from our business for three days at a stretch before we can bring them back. Uh, during the work session, Councilors Clark and Zelenka mentioned their concerns about the whack-a-mole situation. This is exactly correct. It's actually already occurring. In fact, some of these RV dwellers we're dealing with on Cap Court were specifically sent here by another nearby business owner tired of dealing with them. Um, I also agree with Councilor Zelenka. You should be thinking now whether industrial areas or fringe areas are really the right place for campers to be. There are no services or stores in fringe areas, and these industrial areas are dangerous for children. We observed three kids living out of one RV and actually videotaped an unsupervised toddler relieving himself right in the industrial roadway, and of course there's nowhere to play. So for these reasons, I strongly support the city creating designated safe spark parking spaces for these campers including accommodations for families. It's simply not reasonable to expect this problem to go away without significant financial investment resulting in a place that people can be sent to rather than just telling them they have to move two blocks away. Thank you very much for your efforts in dealing with this. Thank you, Mia. Um, it looks like Otis has dropped off. So next is Shia followed by Khalil Niemeyer. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I'm Sia. I filled out a community safety initiative allocation survey and spoke at both listening meetings. I have also been listening to the ad hoc committee on police policy meeting consistently. The city staff, Kevin Octalker, plays a very important role to lead this project. It includes, but not limited, to determine the CSI survey structure and question. He will make a recommendation to council on the allocation of the CSI in response to the community engagement. However, Kevin's spouse, Irena Altalker, is the director of the Eugene Police Foundation, whose stated mission is to organize extra budgetary gifts to EPD. Irena Altalker is also vice president of real estate at the OB Companies, a local property development developer and manager. manager. OB's company is also the main donor for Councilor Clark's campaign. Kevin Altalker, Irena Altalker's spouse, managed the CSI project for the city since before its passage. Via payroll tax, the CSI represents an actual budgetary gift 
of over 15.3 million from the working people of Eugene to EPD. It's just a small part of a conflict interest and uncovered corruption. The full statement with clear demands will be sent to all city council and the media. When people use their spare time to advocate for climate justice, housing justice, and social justice to build a better community, Eugene City Council has played the fool of the community by ignoring and or hiding conflict interest and corruption. Mayor Venice, do you know about this but, but do not care? Is it the same belief you have been, you have when you deleted the people's comment just saying it's not my vote below your campaign ad? You clearly, clearly said you would not be expected to pay to the public opposed opposition, uh, opposition and objection. Transparency is a clear, clearly an ongoing concern. City manager Madary, you staff, Chief Skinner, undeniable know of the conflict of interest at the center of this work from the beginning. Do we also do not know or just do not care to know? Can our talker and the Chief Skinner need to be fired? Suspension of OCSI fund disbursement to EPD until the Independent Commission overseeing public's input has presented its fundings. City Manager, Madari, Mayor Venice, and the City Council take full accountability for their role in overseeing this process. It's so corrupted, very disappointing. Thank you. Thank you, Shia. Next is Khalil, followed by Rob Fassett. Good evening, Councillors. I'm Khalil Niemeyer. I'm an owner of a 50,000 square foot warehouse uh, located at 3490 West First Avenue in Ward 8. Um, our building sits on a three acre site um, and it's on West First on one side and then it also wraps around the full length of Cap Court. Um, since we purchased this building several months ago, we've had numerous is issues with RVs on the east side of Cap Court from drug dealing to unleashed unregistered pit bulls roaming onto our property. Uh, to probably most disturbingly, a family of three children that seem to be totally unintended and uh, were even urinating in the street on a couple occasions. Um, but basically, our main, the main issue I wanted to talk about tonight uh, related to it, you've already heard from two of my um, fellow business early owners earlier tonight. But what I wanted to touch on was um, the fact that at least most of these RVs and the dwellers in them, um, I believe they're choosing to live there instead of paying rent. Um, one of the guys actually just bought a Mercedes to kind of put it in perspective. Um, and then another guy has three RVs that he uses, two of them he lives in, and uh, one he just uses for storage. And then he also occasionally buys and sells and fixes up RVs. And he also has a full-time job. Um, and then there was a, another RV, the same one that actually had the children, um, and they were selling drugs out of it. And I believe they liked it because it was pro uh, close proximity to their customers, sometimes 20 or more people a day would go into that RV. Um, and I believe these folks choose to be here and could actually afford to pay for um, a place with hookups, but just don't. Um, and yeah, I think that um, one of them even told me that they're never going to be able to kick me out. Um, I've been here a year and a half. And so I really agree with the proposed changes to the parking enforcement rules. And I believe there should be an exemption for businesses uh, owned vehicles. Um, and I also believe that we need um, a realistic long-term solution to the problem of car camping in our industrial area. And that's why I strongly support designated parking spaces for these people. Uh, and hopefully these spaces would have services close by. Um, I believe this is a good long-term solution. Thank you guys so much for your time. Have a good night. Thank you, Khalil. Next is Rob, followed by Nate. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good evening, Mayor Venice, Councilors, and City Manager Madiri. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Rob Fassett. I live in Ward 2. Uh, I want to talk a little, as someone did a bit ago, about having uh, a few who don't follow the rules and laws, but rather than focusing on unhoused people, focus on people in power uh, and power to cause so much greater harm when they don't follow the rules and who are not subject to being continuously policed despite the damage they cause to the city and its people. To that end, I wanna add my name to the list of people concerned about the conflict of interest arising from having the manager of the Community Safety Initiative Project for the city be the spouse of the director of the Eugene Police Foundation. 
Uh, it's frankly madness, and I can't figure out whether council knows about this and thinks it's okay or just doesn't know about it. I'd be eager to hear about that after public comment. Uh, the Eugene Police Foundation, like police foundations everywhere, is organized explicitly to fundraise for gifts to the Eugene Police Department for equipment, technology, and toys not otherwise funded through the ordinary EPD budget. The director of that foundation is married to the city staff person managing the CSI, which then allocated a gift of over $15 million from the workers in Eugene to EPD for equipment, technology, and toys not funded through the ordinary budget. Before the CSI passed, council commissioned a poll of the citizens asking their foremost concerns. The results couldn't have been more clear. Homelessness, homelessness, homelessness. More policing wasn't even a blip. And then boom, 65% of the CSI funds over $15 million directly from the workers' paychecks to explode the EPD budget for toys like their shiny new hyper surveillance RV we've seen around town. 15% more for services that support EPD like courts and jails, another three and a half million dollars, relatively a pittance for housing and other homelessness supports. The community has expressed even more clearly since last summer's protests, no more cops, more housing. We're talking about 15 to $19 million to be stolen from the workers in the city to fund more policing that citizens don't want, obtained fraudulently through this conflict of interest to appease EPD, EPF, the property developers and corporate interests that need violence to defend the unequal wealth that they extract. I'm not gonna keep going too much because I know statements coming out other people have spoken, it's obvious what the problem is. You know, echoing Jacob's comments a little earlier, the Coates models thrust Eugene into the national spotlight in a positive light. Thank you, Rob. Your time has concluded. Next is Nate, followed by Tyler Stewart. Hi, I'm from Ward 1 and my name is Nate and I'm here today to uh, talk to y'all about housing. Um, I was a little, I want to directly address the business owners and thank them for their input. Um, I like very much that they were promoting the city, finding a solution to our housing by creating some RV camps around town, RV sites perhaps would sites that people could be into, could hook up their RVs and live in sustainably with low barriers or no barriers. Um, that's a really good solution. I do wanna caution people that complaining about unhoused residents brings the police and enforcement, which leads to further problems. Um, and that's something to think about. Perhaps complaining that the city does not have a solution is the complaint we should bring. Um, I see now what the city has been doing since December 2nd. On December 2nd, the big sweep of Washington Jefferson Park was deeply concerning to me. Um, and since then, there's been a sweep almost every week, if not more than that. They've been sweeping everyone from all around the city into three crowded sites. Every week there was a new suite and more of our most vulnerable community members were tormented by officials, lost possessions, or were cited. They were all moved into these three sites by the city, by city officials. Washington Jefferson Park was specifically told to people who were swept out of train song that they could go to Washington Jefferson Park. 13th and Chambers was told to people they could move to. Owen Loop Road was told to people they could move to when they were swept out of 5th and Almaden. In the middle of a global airborne pandemic, I was deeply concerned the city was engaging in some strange attempt at genocide by packing everyone into a small enclosed space. But now it's clear that they actually were trying to cause a problem so they could come up with a solution. They got everyone packed into these spots so they could come up with a new rule change of enforcement. With over 4,500 unhoused residents in close quarters, it's really, um, Sec. Sweeping everyone is not the solution. Housing is the solution. You need to get people into spaces and give them spaces and buy the land that they can stay on. Um, you have this, the solutions are all in your pockets. And for some reason, y'all just think you just can use enforcement as a tool. And enforcement really is not the tool to get people into housing. 1059 Willamette should be housed. Thank you, Nate. Next is Tyler Stewart, followed by Alethea Latoff. Greetings, Mayor, City Councilors, and City Manager. Uh, I was disturbed to read uh, the article in today's Oregonian detailing misconduct by UOPD Officer Troy Phillips, 
against Elaborio Rodriguez um, in the non-lawful stop. Uh, Rodriguez was shot by EPD five days after Officer Phillips was fired by the UFO. Uh, the stop by EPD is one that many would argue they didn't have reasonable suspicion to stop and detain him. I urge our city to commence a truly independent investigation into the shooting death of Elaborio Rodriguez by EPD. What happened to Elaborio was not right, and I don't think we have the whole story. We need a second look. Secondly, we're in a Kairos moment where we must embody other-centered love and broaden our imagination as to what love and our resources can do in our community. We must use our tax money and resources in radical ways to fund human thriving and correct cycles of systemic racism and poverty. This includes using a majority of the CSI funding to fund housing and resources to help our poorest and unhoused thrive, continuing to sweep our poor and houseless citizens away when there is nowhere safe and sanitary, sanitary for them to go and failing to address their basic needs and correct cycles of systemic racism and poverty is unloving and immoral. I urge the city, thirdly, I urge the city to say no to the existing 1059 Willamette proposal unless all of the property is used as a homeless shelter or all of it's used for truly low income housing. A thousand dollar a month studios that are plentiful are not truly low income housing when a third of our citizens can afford no more than $625 a month in rent. Thank you and please be with all of you. Thank you, Tyler. Next is Alethea, followed by Charles Arford. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Mayor Venice, City Manager Maderi, and City Council members for this opportunity to speak. My name is Alethea Lita, and I'm a resident of Ward 2. I'm here today to testify about Eugene's reliance on fossil fuels. First, I would like to thank you for letting the franchise agreement with Northwest Natural lapse. This was a bold move and is already inspiring other municipalities to leverage franchise agreements to reduce their own dependence on fossil fuels. I'm the mother of a three-year-old who is the love of my life. She is the most joyful person I've ever known and has a deep connection to and love for the natural world that we are all part of. It breaks my heart to know that my little one is headed further into an environmentally unstable future. However, I also know that humankind are incredible problem solvers and capable of amazing transformation that can change the trajectory of the future. It is still possible for my little one to grow up in a world that is thriving, where people and the planet are respected and cared for. That is why I'm asking you as Eugene's representative body to keep up the fight and ensure that we transition to becoming a city that prioritizes above all else people in the natural world that we are integrally connected with. I'm joining the Fossil Free Eugene Coalition and requesting that the city of Eugene take immediate action to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels by banning construction of new gas infrastructure mandating the transition of all utilities in the city to 100% renewable energy by 2030, and levying a fee on Northwest Natural and other polluting corporations to create a fund that transitions low-income and historically marginalized communities from fracked gas to electric appliances and to retrofit homes to increase efficiency. Thank you for your time and your efforts on behalf of the community. Thank you, Alethea. Next is Charles, followed by Jen Hornaday. My name is uh, Chuck Arford, Ward 8, uh, fully vaccinated. I was so happy to read in the Register Guard that workers at Northwest Natural want solidarity with the community. I was active in my union for 22 years, paid my dues, went on strike, and even stood on picket lines for other unions. Thus, I support labor and workers' rights. And most folks who are concerned about climate change also support unions and labor. And we encourage our representatives 
to side with workers and push legislation that is worker friendly and creates new jobs, especially family wage jobs, especially green. Uh, Chuck, I'm sorry, um, your sound has gone out. We cannot hear you. Except to repeat this year, with April looking to be the driest April ever recorded in Lane County. Worldwide ice measurements indicates that we are in the worst case scenario for climate change. And a big, big reason for this is methane leakage from natural gas production and use. An honest discussion and means acknowledging that the U.S., with 5% of the world's population, has, over time, produced 25% of all greenhouse gases, more than twice that of China. We're way over budget. We cannot point our fingers at anyone. An honest discussion includes the fact that methane leaves the atmosphere much more quickly than carbon dioxide. So the fastest and best way to reduce global warming now is to reduce atmospheric methane. Workers from Northwest Natural may not want to hear this, but we need to talk about this. It's all of our children and grandchildren who won't have a viable future if we don't solve this now. Maybe the union that represents Northwest Natural workers can invite members of the community to have a discussion about jobs and climate change. Chuck, it looks like you have froze, and so we are unable to hear you or see you. I apologize for that technical um, issue. Um, so we're going to move on to Jen Hornaday, followed by Matthew Yu. Jen, please unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Jen Hornaday, and I am the owner of Healthy Bees Equals Healthy Gardens, and I received the Rachel Carson Award many years ago. Um, I've been creating pesticide-free neighborhoods in Eugene for over 12 years, and I've worked for the city of Eugene since 94, so I do a lot of outreach. I'm always volunteering in natural areas and parks, and now I'm working at a grocery store for, min for minimum wage, and I'm asking for help to, for the city to uphold the rules for not allowing homeless people to camp along our natural river areas, along West Bank Park and specifically Maynard Park. And we've had a little bit of um, neighbors recently or tents the past few weekends and it's just, um, so difficult for me who's cared for these areas for over 20 years as a park ambassador and planting trees to see uh, litter strewn about and um, human feces in the wood chip piles where I put around the trees and needles and then obscenities as soon as it's dark. And we deserve to be able to have safe, quiet places so that we can rest. This Maynard Park is an area where all the Echo Apartments people come in and they've got the low income apartments coming behind my house now and this area is a safe natural area for people to access the river and to go enjoy the natural areas for their own respite and quiet and safe and appreciate the land. Um, I like to be able to have a river road community gardens in Maynard Park and by allowing homeless people to be here for an undetermined amount of time could uh, have trash and needles and glass and make the special river road soil uninhabitable for a healthy garden. And so many people and pets and children access this park every day in the, in the river. And I would like to be able to keep that, to be able to really appreciate mother earth and what we have for our natural resources. And please work together with us to, that I do have a lot of compassion for the people of homeless and I've helped them in many years over the years to be able to work in the gardens and help when I can and always gifting. But for me making $12 an hour now and for really trying to work and work and work for a mandatory for everybody, I'd really appreciate. Thank you, Jen. Your time has concluded. Next is Matthew Yu, 
followed by CNA Mass. Matthew, go ahead and speak. Go ahead, Matt. You can start. Hello? Hi, we can hear you. Sorry. Uh, oh, um, oh my gosh. Uh, hello? Hi. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, hi, um, Matthew, you word for, thank you very much for listening to me, uh, city council hearing us out. Um, there's a lot of work that y'all been doing on getting those spaces secure, working with local businesses to make sure that way it can be, uh, equitable like resolution for everyone and i think oh no oh my gosh um oh oh my gosh i'm so behind uh, sorry. Uh, i got a lot of lag um and so yeah thank you for doing that uh thank you for um considering doing another plan for 1059 because that's the community place uh community land grant that we need to do in like perpetuity for people as a whole, uh, for everyone in Eugene, not just like for profit developers. And so the way that things are going down, especially with the CSI, I definitely uh, ask you to look at those different options and those different questionable behaviors and practices that got brought up tonight. But on another note, I'm uh, asking to speak about getting a new resolution to create easier access to reporting hate bias crimes here in Eugene. Looking at the EPD statement, looking at the last interaction they had at the HRC I was attending, this also ties on to some intergovernmental relations uh, bits I would like to talk about if that's a place where some of the recommendations coming up are going to come from because the organization that I've got some information from is very good at figuring out where current legislation is that will very much improve community health and so uh, please engage more community input upon bills that are important to all of us and will impact us all. Like right now, there's a House bill that's looking to make racism a public health crisis on a state level declaration style. And uh, to help doing that and addressing that, right, there's a lot of bias crime reporting work that's been done. And I would very much like to increase that here in Eugene and work on Fabio's already amazing work by allowing video access, by making sure that resolution comes to these reports through a process that is transparent and trackable and documented that all the reports go through the human rights neighborhood involvement commission and get reported to the epd on behalf of that victim that could be traumatized by the racism and practices that despite best intentions and despite hundreds of thousands of dollars at training have not created a better Thank you, Matthew. Your time has concluded. Next is Sarah Lamog. Um, it looks like CNA Mass has dropped off, so next is going to be Sarah Lamog, followed by Ethan Klein. Good evening, City Council and Mayor Venice. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. This is Sarah Lamog, Ward 5. Uh, congratulations on your new home, Councillor Clark. Do you feel safer now that you have moved closer to the EPD station? I bring up safety or rather the idea of the cloak of safety because I have grave concerns regarding the entire CSI oversight process and proposed budget allocation of funds. It has come to my attention that the CSI manager is Kevin Alt-Tucker. This is the same Kevin Alt-Tucker who is also the lead staff for the ad hoc committee on police policy. And this is the same Kevin Alt-Tucker who is married to Irene Alt-Tucker. You know, the Irene Alt-Tucker who is the director of the Eugene Police Foundation. If there is such a thing as conflict of interest, Kevin and Irene Alt-Tucker have it. In fact, they are walking conflicts of interest. I echo the same demands others before me have made. One, that the city fire Kevin Altucker. Two, 
that council enable an independent commission to investigate and provide a full public accountability how this oversight was even allowed to happen. Three, the suspension of all CSI fund disbursements to EPD until the independent commission overseeing public input has presented its findings. And four, that Chief Skinner be fired for turning a blind eye to this conflict of interest, especially when he claims to be such a proponent of transparency. Thank you. I yield my time. Thank you, Sarah. Next is Ethan Klein, followed by phone ending in 327. Uh, uh, my name is Ethan Klein, and I'm speaking tonight from Ward 1. The city and city leadership claims they have heard the public's response regarding community investment for the proposed FY22 budget. Yet, when we get into the numbers, the budget tells a much different story. One-time investments comprise approximately 0.54% of the total $724.3 million budget. Investments for the homeless budget account for 0.1% of this total. Investments in the Bethel neighborhood account for an offensive 0.0027% or just $20,000. Meanwhile, the largest investments are centered on the downtown, most of which is for increasing policing. The budget emphasizes the multi-million dollar investments in the upscale urban renewal districts of the downtown and riverfront. And it suggests these districts are vital to all of Eugene's residents, even those who won't be able to afford or meaningfully access them. The police department accounts for approximately a whole 8% of the gross budget. With the fate of the CSI funding still pending, we can only safely say that the police budget is purported to decrease by 1.3%. But what fails to be mentioned is that the police budget will have actually still increased by roughly 1% when considering that it went up by over 3% in 2021. This decrease for 2022 is simply not meaningful. There's no other way to put it. Last summer, the city council claimed they didn't have the time to change the FY21 budget in the face of mass protests against racism and police violence. With the proposed FY22 budget, we see a budget that does little but name drop George Floyd in a performative nod. This statement was not only recycled verbatim from the FY21 adopted budget as if nothing has changed over the past year, but is also a gross appropriation of a real victim of police violence, especially after a year of heightened public outcry for decreasing police funding funds and in reallocating those funds to holistic community improvement at a local level. I implore the city and city officials to take the next two months to actively listen to your community, not just hear them, boldly and meaningfully reallocate police funds to invest in the most underserved people and parts of our community and our global climate initiatives. I yield my time. Thank you, Ethan. Next is phone ending in 327, followed by M. Rink. Hi, this is William Smith from Ward 1. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to um, talk about wireless towers and wireless safety. Uh, first, I'd like to point out that it was just a year and a half ago that uh, there was a work session and uh, uh, apparently uh, the, the discussion was very limited uh, and health issues were not allowed. Um, and later it was found out that there had been a federal decision overturning an FCC order. It was case number 181129, uh, which vacated the FCC order and hence allowed review, environmental review, health review. So uh, we still haven't had that discussion. We can, uh, according to law. So I, I'm hoping that the city will reconsider this, especially given that in the next year and a half, um, the, the millimeter waves are due to be turned on, uh, is my understanding from city staff. And this has become more urgent for me, not just because of my own health issues related to wireless, um, the current wireless technology, but recently uh, it was brought to my attention, uh, WikiLeaks 54 second video um, in which uh, 10 Dutch people uh, were, are seen enjoying 
a leisurely stroll on a bridge across a beautiful river, not unlike our own, uh, they're near a wireless tower that suddenly becomes a deadly weapon and devastates all people, wildlife, and the entire surroundings in that video. Uh, I, uh, I ask that um, you please consider this, that our wireless towers are powerful microwave technologies that can be weaponized. Uh, once they're installed and operational, they can very quickly become weapons. They can cook us very quickly. They can also cook us very slowly, like the proverbial frog in the pot of water. Thank you, William. Your time has concluded. Um, next, we're gonna have Corey Northra. It looks like M. Rink, your hand is lowered. If you would like to speak, please raise your hand. And same with Eugene Chamber of Commerce. Your hand has been lowered. If you would like to speak, please raise your hand. And to Charles Arford, your video froze. So if you would like to speak again, please raise your hand. So now we're gonna hear from Corey Northrup followed by Brooklyn. Hi there, good evening. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to the council and, and mayor. I uh, listened to the work session that you had earlier on changes to parking in targeted areas, primarily in West Eugene and revisions to chapter five of the city code dealing with parking laws. Um, I'm glad that um, Councilor Semple, Syrett and Keating all emphasize the need to provide alternatives to unhoused individuals who are the people that will be disproportionately affected by these proposals um, before any of these ideas are actually implemented. Um, just in general, we need to pursue more measures and programs that actually assist and help people to stabilize their situations so that they actually have a better chance of obtaining uh, a more permanent solution to better their livelihoods. Um, it's significantly more difficult to find employment and housing if you're constantly having to move around and you don't have a safe place to keep your belongings. Um, I echo all the comments that have been made regarding the city um, turning down the proposal with Northwest Natural the Agreement and um, I just encourage you all to not listen to the greenwashing of their dirty business. Um, we really need to pursue such, um, ideas that will be truly more clean for the environment if we want to have a future that includes human beings. Um, I also agree that the 1059 Willamette project should be reconsidered. Um, Thousand dollar studio apartments are neither in demand or are they affordable. Um, and completely unrelated, I'm really curious about the timer. Uh, where does it live and who operates it? Thank you very much for the opportunity. Have a good night. Thank you, Corey. Next, we're gonna hear from M. Rink, followed by Brooklyn. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Um, I'm gonna be brief. Uh, I, just, I wanna echo, I'm, I'm Paul by the conflict of interest interest that's being raised tonight by several of uh, previous commenters. Uh, seems like a gross, it is a gross conflict of interest. Um, how this could have gone by you all, did it go by you all? I think you really need to account for that. And I think that the demands that other people have voiced are entirely reasonable. Uh, in the whole, whole process is contaminated. Um, and I'm going to leave it there because actually uh, it just really upsets me and other people have spoken much more clearly than I'm capable of doing tonight. So thank you for your time. I yield. Thank you. And our last speaker for the public forum is Brooklyn. Hello. Am I going to be able to see myself? Sorry. Usually can't. There I am. Okay. That helps. Um, hello, my name is Brooklyn. I live in Ward 1. I 
I'm going to try to talk about some, like, so a personal story, right? Because I think we talk a lot about people without homes and people who are, need help. And, you know, I've been that person. And, um, you know, I've, I've had a family and, you know, been unemployed and underhoused and, you know, living in a garage. And I've doubled up with, dis with my disabled mother while she waited on um, housing lists. You know, I, I see people talk about calling 211. I've called 211. I've called all of the places that they tell you to call when you call 211, and those aren't really resources. And I'm sure you've heard this story, but once we got up on the waiting list, she got, you know, waited a, two years to get into subsidized housing that would fit in her small income. Um, she was denied over an algorithm that was like a rental score, not even a credit score that had some mistakes in it. And we were not able to contact to get that fixed in time because it's an out of state management company. So many of these like HUD facilities that are managing the senior and disabled housing and the people, those, those properties are managed by out of state for, you know, even if they're nonprofit, they're still like big management companies. And I, and you all, then you also have little amazing things here in Eugene, like Square One Villages or the Blair Housing Co-op. So like, I know this community knows how to self-manage. So why are there so many places being managed by these big, huge corporate entities when we could be having the people living in the communities managing themselves? And then you could empower people by teaching them how to manage themselves, you know, that would be a really big step, you know, and many people work, come to these meetings, like, you know, Eric Jackson and all these people, they have like a lot of passion and you could include them and you can include the people that are serving, not by hiring people who have degrees to manage them, by teaching them how to empower themselves. Um, and there's a lot of research, there's a lot of information out there if you want to read about it. And I wish you would do a little bit more reading about abolition, eight to abolition. I, I wish that you would do that work. Thank you. And thank you. And Mayor, that concludes the public forum for those who signed up prior to the 735 deadline. Thank you very much, Naya. Thank you all of you who took the time to testify. It was a good range of issues that you addressed. And I see that a number of counselors would like to comment or ask questions. So I will turn that over to them. Counselor Syret, then Counselor Zalenka, then Counselor Evans. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thanks everyone who came to speak tonight. Uh, first, could someone on staff answer the question about the timer. I'm sure other people are curious about who operates it and where it resides. We never have explained that. I feel like that should be the mystery that can the timer goes stop on forever. While we wait for that answer. Thank you. <laughs> the timer does not mystery. like you. <laughs> Naya, do you want to answer that? Sure. Um, be vague though. We want to keep the mystery going. <laughs> Um, so, uh, there is a person who's running the timer behind the scenes. They are also um, demoting and promoting people to panelists and um, helping um, with technical difficulties that arise. So, the person who's doing the timer is usually doing more than just being the timer. Um, and it switches. Uh, usually, each meeting, there's three of us. and. Uh, we decide on Monday who's going to be doing the timer for the meetings for the week based nice. on our schedules and availability. <laughs> so it's a team effort. That is correct. So when we notice the timer's not going or something, we try to holler and let each other know. But at the same time, we're also looking at text messages and emails, um, making sure uh, nobody needs assistance during the meeting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Naya. Um, uh, I wanted to ask the um our public works director who i think is still on here um we got some testimony about impacts at, at uh, wsj and then concerns about maynard park so i know some of the closest campers to those businesses that amanda came and spoke about have been moved um, but obviously there's still uh, a couple of hundred people parking there and those folks will be prioritized to move to the new uh, locations that we're working on. Um, but I was gonna ask Matt if he would speak to 
you know, just a quick update on how staff is working in that park. And then also, uh, could you tell us, are there any plans to have sanctioned camping at Maynard Park off River Road? So to the last question, I do not know of any plans at this time for sanctioned camping at Maynard Park. Mm -hmm. um, as far as WJ, we still have two, uh, basically what we're calling park hosts, folks that are there eight hours a day, five days a week. We also have um, some site security that come by in the evenings to see if there's anything going on at the park that would need to be addressed. We continue to you know, work directly, those teams work directly with the folks that are um, camping in the park daily to help manage um, you know, expectations for safely staying there, make sure that trash is taken care of, assisting with dis disputes. And if we're not able to resolve an issue, we, we do have some folks that have to leave that facility. So we also work with police, um, you know, as, as needed, if there are criminal issues that are going on in WJ. Thank you very much. Um, so I, I, moving on, I, I want to appreciate um, those who come before council to speak their minds and give us input put both tonight and in our many prior public forums and the ones we will have in the future. While I don't agree with what everyone has to say or even how they might say it, I want to give you all credit for being willing to show up in person, even in this virtual format, to state your case to us and to the rest of the public who might be watching. It takes a certain amount of courage to come out in this public forum and speak your mind publicly, which attaches a measure of accountability to, for what you say. This is in contrast to certain individuals who use emails to engage in personal attacks, smears, bullying, and other forms of uncivil discourse. These attacks via email are directed at government staff, elected officials, board and commission volunteers, and they are cowardly, irresponsible, and provide no value to the public discourse. Now, this is not a slam on people who choose to share public comment via email. Of course, not everyone can show up in person, and I definitely read all the emails I receive from those who are seeking to share their points of view responsibly. But I want to especially appreciate all of our community members who use their effort to influence this council responsibly and with the accountability that comes with showing up in person to address us. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Zaleka. Here, here, Councillor Syrett. Um, thank you all for coming this evening. Um, I wondered if the city attorney, I'm gonna put you on the spot, Catherine, to give us a brief description of what constitutes a conflict of interest, um, actual potential perceived and, and what bias means in decision-making. Um, I th think that would be very helpful for a lot of people. Certainly. So um, when we're talking about a conflict of interest under kind of the, the statutory government standards and practices type conflict of interest that we often talk about and that there's a government standards and practices commission that regulates it for the state. I, there are two types of conflicts of interest. There's an actual conflict of interest and then there's a potential conflict of interest, both of which involve um, a financial or monetary benefit. So if you have an actual conflict of interest, a decision or recommendation that you as a government official or any government official can make would absolutely have a financial benefit or detriment to you. A potential conflict of interest is that your decision or recommendation could have a financial benefit or detriment to you. So it always has, it's referred to as a pecuniary interest in the statute, but it's just a, it's, it's financial, a monetary, that's what conflict of interests are. Biasness comes up and it really, when you, you address it most often when you actually sit as a body for quasi-judicial land use decisions, which is not very often. So um, the planning commission um, sits in that position more and it, it is a bias is where you have a preconceived 
notion that would prohibit you from making a decision based on the evidence and the facts and the law. Um, so you, everybody has their own personal views and you can have those, but in a quasi judicial land use decision, you have to be able to set those aside and base it on, um, the actual facts and evidence. As it relates to decisions being made, correct? Correct. Yes. Not correct. staff work. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Evans. Sorry about that. Yes, I too would like to echo uh, Councilor Syred and Councilor Zalinka's uh, uh, feelings about uh, folks coming out tonight. It's, you know, you could be doing other things and watching other things, uh, but it's good that you're keeping an eye on us. Two issues real quick, 1059 Willamette. Um, there is an RFP out, correct? That would be, yeah. Is there any way that we can adjust the RFP so that we could look at, um, you know, having a percentage of AMI built into it so that, you know, whoever develops that, that you know, building or it's, it, it's in bad shape, it either has to be gutted or torn down, um, you know, if we can, if we can do that, uh, you know, because I'm, I'm I seriously think that as we make these investments, we too have to, at the same time, have to be aware of what the investments are and uh, what we're doing to help our uh, affordable, uh, affordable housing crisis. Councilor Evans, I think this will be a really good conversation on Wednesday for how you might want to adjust at this point you um, we used council direction to put out the RFP and and had standards in there we had one respondent and that's what we're going to be reviewing on Wednesday so I don't know uh, right off the top of my head how you can adjust that once the RFP is out and there's only one respondent but we'll we'll be ready to talk about that on Wednesday for sure uh, second thing uh, as far as the CSI is concerned I, I really, when we when we uh, took this up a couple of years ago for uh, a payroll tax to support uh, public safety, that includes fire and other, um, you know, departments, not just uh, the police. Um, I think things have have changed dramatically, and uh, given what is going on in the street now. Um, I'm ready to push for some changes in that CSI uh, as we approach um, the, uh, the budget season here, which is coming up on Wednesday night. Um, we do need to put more money into social services. That's clear. Um, we need to figure out how that money would be used and where it would have the most impact. Uh, but, you know, we really need to do that because there are a lot of these things that the Eugene police are doing with sweeps and, I, and everything else um, that could be better handled by uh, someone who is a non-uniform uh, official from the city or, or even the county. So if, if, we, if we can start looking at, you know, making some substantive changes, uh, I would really be in support of that. Uh, so I've got my homework to do over the weekend or over the next couple of days. Okay, thank you. Councilor Keating. Thank you, Mayor. I, I would add to Councilor Evans' comments that it would be uh, great to get a, a, perhaps a, a report from the chief uh, when he can rejoin us uh, about some of the uh, reforms that were passed in Salem today and what EPD is already doing and how, uh, you know, price tag for implementing said reforms and how uh, the CSI uh, helps foot that bill. To Councilor Evans' point, times have changed since it was originally crafted. Moreover, one of our uh, new counselors was on the E-team at the time, and another one of us was advocating for the CSI to be structured in a more progressive fashion. And I'm pleased the council did that. Uh, but perhaps it's, it, it, it's time um, for a review uh, or a larger conversation uh, about, about CSI. I appreciate the, the clarification. 
uh, about uh, a real or, or, or perceived uh, conflicts of interest. I want to give a, a couple uh, shout outs to board two uh, residents, especially Carolyn Partridge. Thank you for your, your, uh, your advocacy in uh, regards to reducing our climate goals by 2030 uh, and appreciate the, the, what I'm assuming is, is a hockey analogy uh, that we have the, or the soccer analogy. Uh, we have the perfect shot on goal and we shouldn't pass it up. Quote, it's immoral to shirk our responsibility for the emissions that we are, are causing. And I'm pleased to see the Biden administration come out swinging in the last few days, advocating for a 50 percent uh, reduction of fossil fuels or 50 percent toward electrification. A happy belated Earth Day. And I thank everyone who, who uh, stepped up to uh, participate in person in the virtual space. And uh, Councillor Syrett, thank you for your comments. Thank you, Councillor Groves and then Councillor Ye. Thank you, Mayor. I, I too wanted to acknowledge uh, Councillor Syrett's comments. And I also wanna thank uh, members of the public that, that sp spoke tonight. Uh, it does take courage to do that. And whether we all agree or not uh, with any particular comment, uh, I know that we all pay attention to that. I also want to speak uh, just briefly and, and remind the public that we're not full-time counselors. These are voluntary positions. And you know the reality is, even when I was part of city staff, I had no idea who was married to whom or who had what relationships. I mean, it's a big organization and it's impossible to know all these issues. And anyway, we heard the city attorney talk about uh, that a little bit as well. And then as to the CSI, one of the things that would really be helpful for me is knowing you know, really what our, our lat latitude is and how that money is used. But also I would like to hear um, some information on exactly how this was sold to the public, how it was explained to the public, how these dollars would be used. It doesn't mean we can't deviate from that, but I would just like to go back to the beginning and know what we set up front because what we say and what we do does matter. So um, that would be helpful for at least this counselor as we, we start the budget process. Thank you. Councilor Ye. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Everyone seems very interested in the CSI. So I just, for the folks watching at home, I wanted to remind them that we have been doing a process of talking to our BIPOC and other underrepresented, underrepresented community members about that um, funding and how perhaps we have missed some stuff and we need to reconsider. And we will be having a work session on May 10th. Um, talking about that. And so, and that is a 5.30 PM meeting. If folks want to tune in um, to get more information and watch that discussion. Thank you, uh, Councillor Clark and then the manager. I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to review this in the future. And I'm sure that the chief will remind us um, I was one of two people who voted against the payroll tax to fund the CSI. And I did so because while I thought it was important for us to uh, make the expenditure, I thought it was the inappropriate way to do it. And it took a lot of uh, uh, heat for being willing to do that. Um, I understand that the world is changing. I understand that people's awareness and, and thoughts on policing are changing. And that's appropriate. And it's fine for us to talk about it. But the number is 193. There's 193 sworn officers. There's been that for a very, very, very long time. And it's the sole reason this was passed as a new taxing mechanism on the city. So, and it's on some of its residents. I think it's an unfair mechanism. I always have, but we decided that 193 was a horribly low number of number of officers on the streets. So for us to now spend those monies elsewhere, I think is, is worse than the decision to fund it in that way in the first place. So um, I'm, I understand that the world has changed and I want to be sensitive. 
But I think our discussions about taking money away from the original reason we put this in, in my opinion, inappropriate funding mechanism in place is a, a double disservice to the people of our community. And I just needed to say that. Thank you. Uh, manager, did you have some comments you wanted to make? Uh, yeah, I was actually going to say most of what uh, Councillor Ye said and just remind us that we had a work session. It, I'm anticipating based on just um, what we're gonna cover in that meeting on the CSI, we'll be, we'll be going over the results from the focus groups and from the surveys that we did both the, um, on Engage Eugene and we did similar to the COVID survey. We also have results from the monolingual uh, group as well. So we, we've done a lot of work and I think there's gonna be a lot of information for you. I'm anticipating you're gonna wanna have a couple of work sessions on this, one to kind of take that in and then another to, to kind of review what your initial commitments were and what we're supposed to be measuring and, and, and hitting the mark on when we come back out in 2027. So I don't think you need to dive into a lot of work this weekend, Councillor Evans, because you're going to get a lot of it brought to you. So just heads up on that. Uh, yeah, Alan. Yeah, just to follow up on that, uh, I thought we had agreed last meeting or meeting before that we were not going to have a conversation about what to do about the police reform or the CSI reallocation or the or the ARPA funds from from um, COVID uh, and because those just weren't ready because we have a lot of information to gather, a lot of information to learn about and a lot of discussions to have. And the budget process isn't the right place to do that. It's really um, uh, we have to spend uh, uh, an inordinate amount of time to go through all of those things. And the budget process is a very short, quick uh, thing that we will amend in the supplemental budget when we decide what to do about it. Thank you all. I, I just want to, I want to uh, back up a little bit and talk about this more broadly and make a, I, I see you Councillor Evans and make a, uh, reminder both to all of you but really to the public and to people who have testified that this city council slightly different composition a few years ago identified that there were three areas where you wanted to do more work and make more investment public safety housing and homelessness and you have done that in three different ways they are happening concurrently so it's not either or it's not we invest in public safety or we invest in housing or we invest in homelessness as a council, you have consistently year after year said, all three of these things are important. We wish to make investments in all three and you will continue to do that. So I think it's an important framework to understand. Those are, those are all valuable. You're standing on, on solid ground in terms of years of decision-making and information sharing, and that will continue. So um, yeah, things have changed, but they haven't changed so much. Those still are critical areas needing city attention and city investment. And uh, Councilor Evans, did you need to make one more comment? Yeah, one, one more comment. You know, when I talk about moving money over, more money over to social services, I'm looking at this from a public safety standpoint. Uh, I don't know how many officers, many of you have probably talked to many police officers, but one I had a conversation with recently said, look, it doesn't make sense for me to be at a location where some guy is completely naked and screaming at the top of his lungs for three hours. That's not a, a, an efficient use of police uh, services or personnel. Uh, this is, when we talk about homelessness, we talk about uh, public safety, fire, or police, the mental health of our community is part of that equation. And I just, I, I just can't, you know, disaggregate that or separate that out, compartmentalize it, because we have to deal with um, things in different ways and not necessarily require a uniform police response. It requires something else. It requires a mental health response. Thank you. So I am, we have been in a meeting for a little over two hours. I'm gonna give everyone a five minute break. 
And um, if you can stand it, because we have a public hearing coming and I hoping that people waiting for that. So it is 945 at 950, we'll come back and start the next item of business. So just black out your screen and we'll, we'll come back.
So with that, thank you all for your uh, perseverance and your commitment to this long night. Uh, we have uh, next on our agenda, a public hearing and possible action. Um, an ordinance allowing for the temporary establishment of safe parking and safe tent sites that are larger than allowed under section 4.816 of the Eugene Code 1971, declaring an emergency, providing for an immediate effective date and providing a sunset date. This is a public hearing uh, for an ordinance allowing for the temporary establishment of safe parking and safe tent sites that are larger than allowed by code. For those wishing to testify during the public hearing, please raise your virtual hand or press star nine if you have joined via phone. Requests to speak will be accepted until the first person to testify begins speaking. When you are called on to speak, please give your name, city of residence, and for Eugene residents, your ward if known. You will have three minutes to comment a timer will appear on the screen to indicate the time you have to speak. The red light indicates the end of the three minutes. City Manager, would you please introduce the topic? Sure thing. I think your introduction actually uh, covered it pretty well, but this is in relation to direction we were given on April 12th. While people are signing up, I'll just say that the, the larger sites, so for the safe parking sites, it could be a group up to 60 vehicles. And for the safe tent sites, a group of up to 40 tents. And I think the or, or tent, sorry, tents approved structures for overnight sleeping, um, but temporarily erected. And I think the one piece that wasn't mentioned is that it's set to sunset on May 1st, 2023, unless it is extended. Okay, thank you very much. With that, I now open the hearing and I will turn it over to Naya, our moderator, to bring in the folks who are set to testify. Thank you, Mayor. So first we have Jackson, followed by Hoops staff. How many total? Seven. Jackson, please unmute. It looks like Jackson um, has dropped off. Um, if you guys recall in the public forum, um, he had technical difficulties, so he might pop back on. So we're gonna go to Hoot's staff, followed by Heather Merrick. Hi, um, my name's Erin Grady. Um, I am on my work Zoom because that's the only Zoom I have, but I'm not here on part of as part of my work or as part of my department. I work at Whitebird, um, and I just wanted to speak to this plan. Um, the first thing that I think is that I feel that people in Washington Jefferson and people in 13th and Chambers should not be removed if they don't want to be moved to these new sites, that these should be like extra in addition to in order to house and keep safe more people. Um, because if you just move people from one place to another, you're not actually the in increasing the amount of people that are experiencing a place to stay that's legal. Um, I also want to echo the opinions of Eric Jackson and Brooklyn, who were bo both formerly unhoused individuals that they said in the public testimony about how people living outside should be put in charge of creating and managing their own spaces and alternatives. I will say that right now I spend time at the 13th and Chambers camp talking to people a lot, and that is what they are doing there right now. There's camp leaders. They're talking to people, they're doing their own de-escalation, they're learning to live together, and they're actually pretty happy doing it. And they're in good relationship with the park staff and have been provided the resources. They need some more resources, but they've been provided a lot of resources that they need to survive. And um, basically, I think that if they're, they're okay with there being an alternative for them to get moved to, but only if it is the, a kind of place that they want to go to. And right now they're not being consulted about the new camps that are being creative, created. They don't even know about them. When I talk to them about the city creating another option for them, they say, that's okay, but we'd really wanna know what it looks like. 
Um, people have told me they don't want chain link fences. They don't want babysitters. They don't want curfews. These are grownups and adults and the city and social service providers tend to infantilize them and treat them in a paternalistic way that makes them not interested in taking part on what of what a solution has to offer. So if you don't have the unhoused help you create alternatives and instead you have city employees with master's degrees, as these other people put it, you are likely to create a solution that no one will want to go to. If that happens, you will waste $9 million, your solution will not work, and you will also do several large and violent sweeps of the camps that currently exist. And then people will just go back to large camps. It will be like musical chairs, just like Jackson said. Um, I also want to say I live three blocks from 13th and Chambers, and I enjoy that camp being there. I do not feel unsafe. Um, I have not noticed an uptick of crime in my neighborhood. We are living peacefully next to them. Thank you, Erin. Um, next, we have Jackson, followed by Heather. And Jackson, if you can please unmute. Uh, um, okay. Hi, how are you? Um, Eric Jackson, um, again, homeless advocate. Um, the 99 camp failed for lies. Uh, there were not several overdoses. There was one, one overdose of a, of a person visiting a low barrier camp that was required by you guys that chief skinner told me the only way that the city council is going to do anything that the city manager john at the time is going to do anything is if it's low barrier to entry i said okay we went through all of this and they recorded as overdoses that's a shame that you do that in the public eye and that will be radically paid for by the county but i appreciate all of you saying no to st vinnie's on that property amen very good now you guys say yes to the 40, I would even go 50 for the tent camps because you want seven or eight people that are gonna stay there and the 40 or 50, you wanna be able to roll out into services and get rid of them. You wanna be able to keep 10 around so 40 will go and rotate out, but you wanna keep 10 around because you want to pay them to be in the place of doing something so you can roll out a three year program and do something. You can't do anything if you guys don't understand that a master's degree is never, ever, ever going to work. I'll never figure out the safety nets that are necessary to support the people that are getting inside of the house, nor will they pick up the phone and call or knock on the door and see how somebody's doing to follow up. People like me will that are on the street. When I applied for a job for the county homeless services supervisor, I don't do it half heartedly or thinking that it's a joke. I do it with every ounce of my soul as an entrepreneur for 20 years. Things that people go to college and get master's degrees for, I did in life, very much so. I'm not out here for the homeless issue because I don't have a brain and because I don't have a voice. That's exactly why this is my chosen passion. It's something that has to be done. It's something that has to be seen. You have to change your mind, Mike. You have to change your mind in the way that things go. You can't look at it from the perspective you're looking at it at. You have to sit down and talk and you can't say that you don't have time to because right after I asked you to two years ago, you sat down with Wake Up, no problem, multiple times. And that was unacceptable because you wouldn't even have coffee and that's unacceptable. And I'm looking down at the corner towards you because that's where you are on my screen. I don't know if you're there on everybody else's screen. Um, Keating, I, as I said, Matt, you did great just saying no to the other thing um, and, and putting that point across. And I appreciate that. But you guys got to realize that if you don't come up with 80% of the homeless to fix the 100% of the homeless problem, which is a very small number of people, you're never going to fix it. You can have 20% master's degrees, but they're not necessary because you can pay the homeless a little less and you can do a lot more. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Next is Heather, followed by Eugene Chamber. Mayor Venice, Council. My name is Heather Merrick, and I am testifying on behalf of Lane County Legal Aid. Nearly 2,500 Eugenians are unhoused. Recent data indicate that between two-thirds to three-fourths of unhoused people locally are unsheltered, meaning up to 1,900 residents sleep on streets, in parks, and similar spaces. That is one in every 100 Eugenians. I've seen clients join, join those ranks recently, 
some becoming unsheltered for the first time following eviction. They are on shelter wait lists, but the lines are winding along. One client moved into a tent and worried what would happen to his pet should he be arrested. I broke the news to another client that she must move her RV. When she asked me where, I had no answer. Research shows that virtually everyone commits crime sometime, but one in a hundred Eugenians risk breaking the law daily by merely existing. My clients comply with statutes by leaving their homes only to violate local codes by becoming homeless. They contact us to understand their legal options only to learn that there are none. The need for safe and legal places for people to reside is undisputed. Countywide, we have 438 sanctioned spots for unsheltered residents. Establishing more sites is a step in the right direction, but the current proposal needs reworking. First, the math does not add up. <clears throat> it may reduce tent spaces. It creates 300 while removing existing encampments, including the one at Washington Jefferson, which alone has 240. With one in 100 Eugenians unsheltered and an eviction crisis looming, we recommend significantly increasing the number of new sites and maintaining those that exist. Second, we discourage any one-size-fits-all approach that mandates people with unique needs and barriers live in a particular managed site. Third, this proposal will not justify resumption of the camping ban. Such enforcement will violate constitutional rights and expose the city to liability. Moreover, research consistently shows that punitive approaches are ineffective at mitigating homelessness or its impacts on the surrounding community. It worsens the problem and uses tremendous resources. To meaningfully respond to the needs of residents and businesses, Council should adhere to evidence-based practices and expand upon its commendable efforts to increase housing and shelter options. In the meantime, the city should allow people to shelter in place when they pose no threat beyond sleeping in a tent or car. That ensures the safety of all Eugenians and does not prevent law enforcement from responding to actual criminal activity. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Next is Eugene Chamber, followed by Sabra Marfroft. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. My name is Brittany Quickwarner. I'm a resident of Ward 5. I'm here tonight on behalf of the Eugene Chamber of Commerce to voice our support for the proposed ordinance. We need a range of solutions and a continuum of solutions for individuals living on the street, and we have to keep pushing in multiple areas. Most ideal is finding every single individual on the street a permanent place to call home that they can afford and that has the wraparound services they need to get well. That is our goal and our North Star, but until we have the housing available to do that, we have to do something. While we work together towards our North Star, the next best thing is temporarily sheltering individuals as fast as we can to get them out of the elements and into a setting where they can get well. Not every type of temporary shelter works for everyone, nor are they all equally as easy to find as others. The small sites you have proposed over the last few months have made an impact on those individuals that could access them, but we know we still have thousands more on the streets that need help. For those individuals, we have to move faster and more efficiently, and the ordinance before you tonight helps the city do just that. It will take years to find spaces for 10 to 20 individuals at a time. We don't have years. Large sites like those proposed will help us more easily make space for those who want the help and in turn help us better isolate those who are committing crimes against homeless people businesses and neighbors. We have a homeless and a crime crisis. This effort to expand safe places for people to legally shelter will move us in the right direction on both of those issues. They do not get us all the way there and they have to continue to be considered alongside a menu of other options. And as such, I appreciate you taking action today on updating our parking rules and putting forward public code changes that will help us better regulate our streets. Both of these ordinances are important and we must address these incredibly difficult, difficult issues together. Earlier tonight, Councillor Evans asked whether we had made progress on finding sites. I do believe progress has been made. Even in the small action of city staff inviting the chamber to participate in the site search committee so the private sector can be engaged meaningfully in this effort. We have a meeting just tomorrow with a handful of private uh, landowners and um, property owners to literally roll out maps and get creative about some of these different spaces and try to find sites that aren't on the market even yet. We have expressed our support and I will again state that we're committed to work hand in hand with the city to find sites needed and allowed in this ordinance. 
It won't be easy, but I'm chronically optimistic and stubborn as hell, so we're going to keep looking until we find them. We're not going to walk away from this issue just because it gets hard, but I appreciate you addressing this from multiple fronts. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. Next is Sabra, followed by Eli. Hi, thank you very much for making an attempt to make this step. I think it's super important. I think it's been a long time coming. And finally, we're here. And I want to echo what the last two speakers have said. Um, I think all of what they said is of value. And I want to suggest that you think about doubling the number and how that might be possible doubling the number of spaces available. And with all that said, it's really important that these big sites not take the life out of the smaller sites that already exist, because the smaller sites that already exist will become the places where people from these larger camps go to take the next step back into a life within society, a life that involves job skills and a life that involves so many of these other things that these large camps will not necessarily be able to help with. And with all of that said, um, I just want to say thank you for finally coming here and really thinking about this and that was it thank you very much thank you Sabra next is Eli followed by Zombie hello I live in Ward 1 I spoke earlier in the public forum I would like to echo Aaron Grady Eric Jackson and Heather Merrick I see no purpose for an abbreviated notice of public hearing other than to prevent public participation. Um, safe legal spots for our houseless neighbors to be during the pandemic was requested by Eugene service providers in March 2020, over a year ago. And on Ju July 7, 2020, you received a memo from Sarai Johnson, which recommended safe sleeping villages and guidelines for unsanctioned camping, yet it took the city until late January to come up with those guidelines, which the city then ignored to continue sweeping people into the same locations, causing the problem that businesses and neighbors are now complaining about. We've known about the problem for over a year. So why the abbreviated notice? Because there was pressure from the chamber? Is this ordinance being proposed to justify sweeping houseless people out of sight during a pandemic prior to the Olympic trials? While I support the intent of providing a safe sleep legal space for our houseless neighbors to exist, I urge you not to adopt the ordinance as is. Someone recently observed that the chain link fenced rest stops look like South Africa apartheid, which explains in part why people would not want to go there. Water is life and access to water should be required at these sites. The current draft ordinance only requires adequate garbage and toilets. It makes no mention of sanitation or water. I strongly urge you to remove section three. The city manager already has authority to implement city code. Section three is currently drafted, which currently gives the unelected city manager unfettered authority and discretion to quote, adopt rules to regulate the safe parking sites and safe tent sites with no guidance or direction from council on how these sites should be regulated. We should not be giving the city manager unchecked authority to create more laws criminalizing the behavior of our houseless community. The draft ordinance also declares an emergency based on quote, illicit or unlawful camping occurring throughout the community. The emergency is not illegal camping. The housing crisis and the lack of housing for people to live in, the, live in is the emergency, not the city's concern with enforcement of laws that criminalize survival. Thank you. Thank you, Eli. Next is Zondi, followed by Nate. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, I want to echo many of the speakers, Eric, Aaron Brady, Eric Jackson, Heather Merrick, um, the speaker who just spoke. Um, and I want to say, though, that um, my while I appreciate uh, identifying places for sanctioned camping, I'm very concerned about the push from at least my neighborhood association and perhaps others for this to be paired with um, what sounds like um, increased enforcement. Um, and so the language of the Jefferson West Side Neighborhood Association um, is very concerning to me and I consider it hate speech. The, we know that when um, specifically the language put out was we should not be providing forbearance to criminal vagrants, predators, travelers, or lifestylers. The association of these various different words um, is similar to Donald Trump saying China virus. So the argument that the Jefferson West Side Neighborhood Association makes is that, oh, you know, it's it's these um, select people within who are within the unhoused population who give all unhoused people a bad name. And yet what they are doing by associ by associating these groups of, of words, criminal vagrants, predators, travelers, lifestylers, is the equivalent of what um, President, former, thank God, President Trump did to incite Asian hate. And um, I think the city should do something to call it out because it's very public hate speech. And um, the link to this hate speech is promoted on the city website. And um, I would like to ask, you know, lifestylers, what lifestyle do the people live who are writing this neighborhood association letter live? Um, so that's one thought. The other thing I want to echo, unfortunately, I can't see the timer, I don't know why, um, is that um, Eric Jackson's point and other people's point about hiring people with master's degrees, I mean, it's getting painful at this point that um, there hasn't been, with, with a number of clearly committed and capable people from within the unhoused community, of which Eric Jackson is surely one, um, that there hasn't been city outreach to engage, for example, his um, expertise, really. Um, and, and so I absolutely um, would ask that the city do that. And then further to know that the Chamber of Commerce has been consulted on citing these places and that and then we hear that the people who are in the camps them, themselves are, have, are not even aware that it's happening is concerning. Thank you. Thank you, Zondi. Next is Nate, followed by our last participants, David and Jessica Campbell. Hello and good evening. Um, here we are, it's 10 o'clock at night, actually 10.15. Yeah, so why are we having a city council meeting at 10.15 at night? That's a good question. Good question, it's because we're doing something shady. We're doing something a little dark, something we're trying to keep out of public view trying to change the city ordinance so we can crack down on homeless people and maybe do some unconstitutional things like violate people's human rights and people's civil rights, you know, just that kind of stuff. So I'm just kind of wondering, I'm reading the ordinance and I'm wondering where they're gonna get water. There's not water currently at the Washington Jefferson Park. Owen Loop does not have access to water. Um, 13th and Chambers, no water there. Um, so they don't really have water. I noticed y'all got a nice shower truck that's a water truck there sitting in the city yard. No one's using it. It's not out there. It's not being utilized. Um, people don't have water. They don't have access. So I guess my other question is really why are city lawyers here, city attorneys here, but not our city accountant? So what you're proposing is creating 300 as yet unspecified sites that you're going to magically create as you force 4,500 people into those 300 sites. And I'm just wondering where's the math? how are they going to fit into the spots? Well, let's say maybe it's only 2,500 unhoused residents in our city. You're going to try and force them into 300 sites. They won't fit. They don't, that doesn't work. So I'm just kind of curious as to how they're going to fit. Maybe you have a different accountant. Maybe you open up some beds in Lane County Jail they can fit into. Maybe we'll push them over to Springfield. I'm just not sure how that's going to work out. Um, I'm also curious as to why they're called campers. 
you know, when I was homeless here, I was not camping. I was surviving. I was surviving and I had nowhere to live. I could not afford my first and last. I would not pass the background checks to get into my Clark's houses. I wouldn't get into anyone's houses because I couldn't get enough money saved up to get in. So the first and last is really, really um, hard to get in this city. Getting into housing is really hard. Um, so if you wanted to provide people with places to be, you start off with 3,000 sites. If you had spots for 3,000 people, you would have a better chance of people getting into housing. I'm also a little, um, I'm deeply offended by Brittany. I'm sorry to bring this up, but claiming the North Star is, um, that is a term used by the formerly enslaved to escape slavery. They followed the North Star. They went to North Star Printing Press, which was run by Marcus Garvey to escape slavery in the South and invoking that now while you're promoting cracking down on the poor is, I find it disgusting and deeply troubling. So Brittany, I'm sorry, you can't really do that. It's not appropriate. It's appropriative. Um, also, just wanna say that we have a sad history of persecution of our poor in this community. And one day we're gonna have to account for it. Thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you, Nate. And next is David and Jessica Campbell. Hello, uh, thanks for being on here so late. I think we have a little bit of a different uh, opinion to offer tonight. Uh, we live on 16th Avenue, so directly um, in front of the microsite that was placed around April 1st. Uh, and we're concerned with the long-term plan of the microsite. So we are 100% in um, support of helping people that need help and that are reaching out for help. Um, people that are choosing not to receive help and be lawless, we are not in support of that. Um, but people who do need help, um, who have fallen on hard times, um, we're concerned that the microsite um, is not set up for a long-term solution for these people. So what is their ability to seek jobs in the future um, that can support our, um, our, our lack of low-income housing? So um, if $1,000 a month is what it's going to cost just for housing, not on top of other bills that we know we occur, incur, like how, how is the city setting these people up for a transition? So the transition to um, be in society. And um, we have asked Sarai Johnson, we have asked other people, what is this transition plan to help people? Because if, if this microsite is, these microsites that are planned in our city are to help people, then we want to support them, but if there is no transition plan and this is a short-term Band-Aid solution, um, then again, we're wasting resources and we fail to help the people that are in need. Um, so we ask that we're provided um, information when we email the city, um, when we're asking how can we better understand the plan of these microsites. Um, and similar to the safe um, camping and tenting, what is the plan to transition these people um, to actually live back in society? Um, because Band-Aid solutions are, are not helping anyone. Um, we all want this city to thrive and invest in our city and, and for people to feel safe and for people to get access to resources. So um, I think that there could be better communication around long-term plans and directly how people are going to have access to transition. Thank you. Thank you, David and Jessica. And Mayor, that concludes the public hearing for those who signed up to speak by the time the first person testified began speaking. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Naya. And that uh, will close the public hearing. And I see that there are a couple of counselors queued up with comments, so I will just turn it right over to Councillor Zelenka and then Councillor Clark. Yeah, um, the homelessness is the symptom. The problem is lack of mental ha mental health services, lack of substance abuse services, and lack of affordable housing. And in the absence of, of comprehensive plans to address all those, um, we're going to do band aids, uh, but. What we've been doing is kind of a sober buckshot approach, multiple programs and services, all working toward reducing homelessness. Um, and we've been pretty successful, but um, I've changed my mind over the last couple of months about the size and pace of, 
of what we've been doing with the opportunity villages and the rest stops, the magnitude and the number of people that are, are it, it's just too great. Um, and we need to move faster and think bigger. And so um, we need to change our thinking about and allow larger organized sites with rules. Um, and so I'm in favor of increase in the numbers that are proposed here. I'm curious as to the numbers 60 and 40. They, they, may, they, they may be too small. Not sure. I, I'd like to hear uh, city manager talk about the, the rationale behind thinking of behind those numbers. Um, but uh, I think we also need to get more sites and more land to put these on, that's the next big hurdle. Once we say, yeah, we can do it, then we have to put them actually somewhere. Um, and I think they need to be spread out around the city. They can't all be located in one part of the city or even two parts of the city. And uh, um, so first question was that. The second question I have is, uh, oh, well, maybe you can answer that question and I'll get to my second question. Yeah. I'm which just... is the number. Yeah, the number. Um, Christy's here, and I know her and the team vetted through that, so I was going to have her answer it. Councilor Zelenka, thanks for the question. So with the numbers that we came up with, what we recognized is that we had a lot of people uh, that are sleeping in cars and RVs in different spots all throughout the city, as we talked about earlier this evening. Now we have a large portion of people that are in a camp in the camp at the WJ. And so just knowing that at a minimum, the baseline for giving people a better place to, um, to be in and access to more services was to do something that provided broader spaces. So what we're looking for right now are large pieces of property that give us the capacity to go up to the limits um, that the ordinance would allow for. And then also think about how we, um, are able to put people together in ways that help them succeed. You know, people that have, um, that either already are succeeding in, um, in how they're uh, working together in, in the different spaces. But our goal is just to really just to find better places for people to be. I also do want to mention is, is that aren't, you know, we want to have services. We want to have um, peer, you know, work on having peer supported uh, shelter situations, um, and just like the other success su successes that we've had in the past. And so there's a lot um, that we're thinking about. One of the things that we're also thinking about is getting uh, the outreach teams moving so we can get out and start talking to more people that are unhoused right now in different areas to find out what, what is it that they would like to see in, in those camps and uh, what do they need to help them be successful. And I hope that that answers your question. I think the piece that was missing there that I just remembered was that there can be multiples of those groups on a single piece of property. If it's, yes, yeah, sir. If it's big correct. enough, yeah. If it's large enough. And so right now, I think we're looking for somewhere around 30, minimum of 30,000 to 45,000 square feet. I, I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, so it's big enough. If it's big enough, the tent sites can have multiple um, sites within it that are segregated. Yeah, we're thinking more in smaller pods, really. Um, like four, and, and that's where the 40 came from. Mm -hmm. And maybe even smaller uh, groupings within that 40. Yeah, well, this is a good first step. We can always change it if we need to. Mm -hmm. um, second question was about section one in the safe parking um, sites. The definition of vehicles includes a car, camper, and trailer. And we just spent a whole bunch of time talking about RVs, and that's not included here. Can you explain why that's not why it doesn't include RVs? I think I'll let the city attorney take that question. Yeah, a good idea. Okay. I, I I did respond to your email. I'm sorry, it was probably later in the afternoon than you. No, had. I saw it. Okay. The um, so the four point eight one six is where we have our exceptions to the prohibited camping, and we set out our descriptions of you know back in the nineties when you adopted the car camping provisions, and you have certain definitions, and vehicle is just loosely just defined, and it includes camper and trailer and vehicle, and then we extended it to Conestoga hut and tent. So 
the the word camper has we have always applied it within our car camping program to apply to recreational vehicles and so i wanted to the way it was drafted was to remain consistent with the terminology that's used within your 4.816 because right now what's proposed to you is an uncodified ordinance but if you ever want to stick it within your that and make it kind of a permanent exception along with your rest stops i wanted to make sure it remained consistent within chapter four because recreational vehicles actually that term is never used within um, the chapter four provisions going back to the conversation you had earlier to tonight regarding addition of the statutory definition of recreational vehicle in chapter five chapter five sucks in a whole bunch of the state statutory provisions in that five chapter five zero one zero section and we cross-reference so we've got to live within the statutory definitions and the statutory definition of camper isn't one we've ever used so i didn't want to use that term because it's actually really narrow so that's why we use recreational vehicle there so two chapters using those very differently yeah so in this case um, in this particular ordinance we're interpreting camper to include rvs yes as, and, al and always as we have in the past so mm -hmm. Correct. Um, last last question is um, in both the parking and the content site um, requires adequate garbage and toilets why not water it's a really good question i know that came up a couple times tonight and just um was checking on the water at the other sites and just so you know that we believe that there is water access and one of us a water truck so what we're looking for is places that might have already have water on the site that we can use but we definitely will be providing that that's that's a foundational thing so and I, and I don't know, I, you know, it's not in the ordinance language, but it doesn't mean we won't be doing that. We'll be doing a lot of things that actually aren't mentioned in the ordinance in terms of, you know, service accessibility and things like that. So. Right, but our intent is, and we will provide water of some form because that's an essential Absolutely. thing in life. Absolutely, 100%. Okay, just wanted to make that clear. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Clark, then Councillor Keating, then Councillor Syrett. Thank you, Mayor. With these new sites, will we, I suppose my question is, I don't know for whom, Christy, Sarah, I don't know. Um, will we be differentiating people who want to get well from people who don't? I, you know, I, I don't think that we are thinking about it in those terms necessarily. What we're looking for is grouping people together that have the ability to succeed. And that's what CSS has done quite consistently. They've really thought, been thoughtful about the groupings of people that they put together because they want them to get along, they want them to succeed. And so that's what we'll be really focused on. Does that help answer that question? No, kind of, a little bit. Not really where I was going, though. Let me try it a different way. Will drug mm -hmm. use in any way be acceptable in any of our camps? So right now, it's not allowed within our rest stops and things like that. It's specifically not allowed and called out that way. And there has been some interest for us to consider that a very small camp with some structure around helping people with addiction issues. We, have, we haven't decided that. And quite frankly, that could be something when we come back on the 19th that I could talk more about as we've kind of pursued what services we might want to consider and get council input. But at this time, these sites and this consideration for this ordinance, no drug use is allowed, is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. So will we be mandating that the people who are currently in Washington, Jefferson or uh, 13th off chambers there be moving to any of these new sites? I think what we're hoping is, as we talked about at our session on the 12th, is that we want to return the park to its intended to use. And so um, our goal will be to give people um, other safe places to be. Yeah, and offering opportunity is wonderful, but that wasn't my question. My question wasn't about opportunity, it was about necessity. Mm -hmm. Will we be mandating that people leave the park what I will say is if we have alternate places for people to go, our intention is, is that we will return the park for public use, which means that um, we will not continue to provide temporary urban camping in those locations. 
When you say not provide temporary urban camping, can you be more specific about what you mean? Well, well, right now, what we refer to at our 13th Avenue site and the site at WJ is, is that we have put together some temporary urban camping uh, programs to help people shelter in place in response to COVID response and, and protocols. And so what we're saying is, is that those were always intended to be a temporary and short-term fix while we were in COVID protocols. And so now we're looking to transition. We recognize there's a high level of need for people to have um, places to, to shelter. And so that's our goal is to create spaces for people to be. So those will no longer be temporary emergency shelter sites. My, our intent is no. <laughs> yeah. And that's what we said on the 12th. Our intent is, is that we would shift away. And that's why in the ordinance specifically, it calls out priority for the people that are in those locations and the people that are car camping. No doubt. Can I, I'm just yeah. going to add something to it because I can just sort of feel your like, be um, yeah. super clear. And I think Christy's totally correct. I think the um, answer to your question is, Right now, camping is prohibited in parks unless um, we're in a condition like we are now. So we have we have guidelines from the CDC. We've been trying to do this temporary piece, but when that's lifted, unless council says we want to establish someplace here, we'll be following the rules and the laws as you have established them and we'll be returning the park to a park and not a campground. And next Friday, when it becomes emergency status again, will we revert that decision? It's not going to revert. What, I don't understand. Like between now and it next Friday, nothing's going to change at Washington. On Friday, that um, we could return to emergency status rather than I. I, I don't extreme. Think. Yeah. And we've been in extreme for a lot of this period. And yeah. So it will stay the same as it is right now until we have a safe place. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to do is create the answer to the folks who live and work and have businesses and homes around Washington Jefferson and around the 13th area who've expressed concern to us for a very long time. People who have done so with the most dire begging sort of emails that we can say, we're not gonna allow that at the park anymore because we've developed an alternative site. Mm -hmm. Can I say that to them in good faith? We're not going to allow that anymore in Washington Jefferson Park. I think you could, I mean, personally, I'd say based on current policy direction, that's accurate. I mean, just, we didn't allow camping in Westmoreland Park. We didn't allow camping in any of the places where you've established microsites. So council could always make a different policy decision about what you want to have happen there, but based on our current trajectory, we are working on a transition plan that when we are, when those shelter in place guidelines start to lift, we want to be prepared and we are actively looking for places for people to be able to go. I appreciate the effort and I appreciate the thinking and I appreciate the work very much. This is hard work. Um, my concern is I want to be supportive of the incremental efforts and the incremental change and the ability uh, to have more places to help more people. My concern is that we're making it worse with, and, and I suppose maybe it's council rather than, than staff. My concern is that we're making it worse because we don't necessitate that people take advantage of the opportunity to get well. We provide the opportunity, but we don't require it. We don't enforce effectively. And so while I want to be supportive of this, I don't know if I can be because I, I suspect we're just making the problem worse in this process. I'll, but I'm happy to listen and change my mind if I hear something different here. Thanks. Okay, Councillor Keating and then Councillor Syrek. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Assistant Manager, for the comment uh, about definitely we will be providing water at Washington Jeff uh, it has been reported that unhoused residents are using the wash stations however uh, for to drink water and I would um, urge colleagues 
to consider adding language in the safe tense safe tent sites description in section one uh the last sentence um all safe tent sites authorized and established pursuant pursuant to this ordinance shall have adequate garbage toilets potable water and access to electricity i bring up that last point because there are rest stops in our community that are using generators to generate electricity which isn't exactly hitting our climate recovery ordinance goals. So if we can find creative ways to partner with eWeb to electrify and deliver potable water, I would be wholly supportive of, 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 of that action. Um, that's, that's one observation. The other, when there's a, a, a motion on the table, Mayor, just so there's, there's no surprises, um, in uh, paragraph uh, 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 B, I guess, um, page one of the attachment, uh, I would be interested in omitting the words illicit camping for the aforementioned reasons in the conversation. And that sentence would read, uh, to support the first sentence, I'm talking about the second sentence under section B, uh, this results in unsanitary and eight unsafe conditions for and I would remove those camping with the unhoused residents. So that it would read, the city is experiencing an increase in the number of individuals living in campers, trailers, cars, and tents in locations that are not intended for that purpose. This results in unsanitary and unsafe conditions for unhoused residents and for the surrounding community, particularly nearby uh, businesses and residents. That aligns with not only the observations I made at the top of, of tonight's meeting, but supported by testimony after after testimony. And it would be premature to make those motions prior to a motion on the table, but I'm announcing the intent so there's no, there are no surprises uh, when, when that particular motion comes up. So it's a little backwards way of doing that, but I, I, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, and I think this is a great first step uh, toward larger FEMA style emergency shelter for our unhoused community. Thank you. Councilor Keedy, can I just say one quick thing? Maybe Christy was going to say it. I just, this is the awkwardness of Zoom. Um, I think you might want to consider if you're going to add those languages around electricity and water, maybe making it a goal and not a requirement because you are, I just tell you based on what I know from my work and development, you're either severely limiting the places where we'll be able to locate something or severely increasing the cost. And I think you might want to make that decision a little down the road, especially with the electricity piece. It's very expensive to drop electricity into a site. Mm -hmm. Just a, I think it's a great goal and something we'll shoot for, but I, I do think that could be a decision that you later want to change. I, I appreciate that. In my final second, I had the timer at one. That was pretty cool. Um, I, I, I'll, yeah, we'll consider that, uh, manager. Thanks for the, for the observation. Um, but we'll, when we get there, uh, I'll, I'll please colleagues don't, don't be alarmed when I make the, those, uh, aforementioned motions. Okay. Councilor Syrett and then Councilor Groves. So I know we're scheduled to possibly take action tonight, but since it's 20 to 11 and we have one other thing to take action on tonight, I wonder if we might want to postpone actually um taking action tonight because there may be amendments as forecast by councillor keating uh that would then generate more discussion so it might it it might serve us all to um do this on wednesday if that's possible um so i just wanted to respond to the public comment i appreciate uh everyone's input I just uh, wanted to offer that in terms of the concern about the microsites and what's the long-term plan. Um, absolutely, the folks at microsites um, are connected with, um, my understanding is with case management, will be connected with case management to help them move into more permanent housing. The microsites are a temporary response. They are not meant to be a long-term living situation for the folks who will be staying there. The Willamette Street development project that we'll be talking about on Wednesday was not envisioned to be housing for very low income people. 
It was actually envisioned by this council to fill a gap in workforce housing and to subsidize workforce housing for a certain portion of our population, which then can help people who are very low income and get in a better place to move out of their permanent subsidized housing, which they are having trouble doing now because the market is so challenging. So we have a number of affordable housing projects that we have helped to fund that are being built or in the pipeline that are meant to serve very low income and low income folks, in, including families. So I support a number of the suggestions that were offered, um, including expanding the number of sites for more people. Um, but of course that's contingent on finding locations and having resources to do that. Um, I also agree that there should be uh, some capacity for self-management and that people who are currently living on the streets should be consulted about what these sites might look like and how they might operate. Um, as far as the comments around fencing at the rest stops being an, some kind of negative thing, that fencing is there to provide the residents of the rest stops with safety and security for them and their belongings. Uh, it's no different than fencing that might be up around an apartment complex. Um, it's not intended to signify some kind of apartheid status on the residents there. These sites have been successful in providing the residents there with a safe and stable place to live and provided many of them with the support they needed to move on to better housing solutions. Okay, thank you for that. Councilor Gross. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm looking forward to supporting this measure. I actually hope we don't postpone the decision. I know it's getting late, but we need to act. It's time to move forward. And I'm eager to get this, this set up and I hope we don't um, acquiesce and allow the sites that are already occupied to stay occupied. Um, we need to return our community to as normal as it can be, while at the same time providing safe locations for people to locate to. Uh, and as far as the microsites, ironically, there's one right at Bertelson and West 7th, which is the gateway into one of our most troubled streets in the city. And when I make my frequent visits in that area, I see order, safety, security at the microsite, which does have a fence, and as I drive down the street, I see no order, no semblance of, of safety. And that's part of the problem. So, I mean, this, I know we've heard from some people tonight that, that want, you know, only to move people that want to go to these sites and, you know, no consequences for, for people who don't want to make a move or follow any rules. And, you know, the reality is, a city is organized society, and one of the reasons it stays organized and the reason it's safe is because we all have rules that we must comply with. So I, I, I look forward to, to passing this and moving in a, a, a direction that provides safety and security and certainty for everyone, the entire community. Thank you. See, the city attorney is... Uh ready to weigh in on the possible actions here. I, yeah, I just wanted to clarify two things because it's come up around amendments and also acting tonight. Um, under your charter, in order for you to be able to act um, with the single meeting, which would be the night of the public hearing, it requires two things. One, which you're all familiar with, is the unanimous consent of the council to do it. And the second one is, is there's no substantive amendments to the ordinance. And so, um, if there is, I would say the changes to the findings wouldn't be considered substantive. Any other changes that are to the actual text of the ordinance, I, I would say you, you should not be acting in this in a single night if you're going to be proposing amendments to the ordinance. Yeah, so I, um, I would like to suggest that I think this, if we, if we postpone to Wednesday, we're not postponing very far. If that gives us an opportunity to actually look at the language changes that Councilor Keating has suggested, that seems sensible and it is, um, and it is late. I think it's, it's good for everyone to look at it with a fresh eye. So we're not gonna put it off by a week. We would just put it off by two days. And um, is that, do I have some head nods on that, that that feels reasonable? 
And I think we can manage the time on Wednesday okay. For that, I'm kind of looking at the city manager, but. Um, uh, what's that? We require a motion for us to consider Wednesday instead of tonight. Yeah. I mean, you, you have the option to act tonight or not act tonight, correct? City Catherine? Yeah, certainly. I mean, someone, if, if everybody, if there's unanimous consent to act tonight, then you can act tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and then, but there, I would say no substantive motions could be made to the ordinance if you choose to act tonight. Yeah. And can they make those an act on Wednesday? Yes, you can. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because then it's the second meeting. So I'm going to suggest that we just um, put put the final vote off until Wednesday, close this conversation, go to our last item of business, which I'm hoping uh, will be quick and not too many speeches. And um, <laughs> and then we can all adjourn. So uh, let's see, let me go to the next one. So this final action is a resolution amending picture plan play a vision and implementation plan for Eugene's parks and recreation system to de redesignate Stryker Field Park a community park. And so city manager, you want to introduce this? Yeah, I sure can. Thank you. I was going to talk really slow and try to introduce controversy to see if we could <laughs> go longer, set a record. Um, this designation, at first, it's exciting to be talking about Stryker Field. I know that we've done a lot of work on this over the years. We've done a lot of public process around this and really determined that the uses that the community is wanting to see there actually fit better with a community park than they do with a neighborhood park. So, for example, one of those things is a small parking lot. Our land use code does not allow that on neighborhood park sites, but does allow it on community park sites. So we're scheduled to begin construction this summer. It's contingent on building permits, which require that community park designation. So we anticipated this in the park and rec system plan, uh, where we included a recommendation to redesignate this to a community park. This is just the final action. Okay, thank you. I'm going to turn this over to Councillor Ye to put a motion on the table. Great, thank you. I move to adopt the resolution attached as attachment C to the AIS entitled a resolution amending picture plan play a vision and implementation plan for Eugene's Park and Recreation System to redesignate Stryker Field Park A, a community park. It's late. Second. I'm sorry. <laughs> Second. All right. Any need for discussion on this? All right. All in favor, please raise your hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And that passes. None opposed. Thank you all very much. Quite a night. Uh, you have my respect for your capacity to keep thinking clearly all the way through. And we are adjourned. <laughs>